Good morning, everybody. The sixth meeting of the 62nd session of the Commission for Social Development is called to order. I invite the Commission to continue its consideration of Agenda Item 3B, entitled Review of Relevant United Nations Plans and Programs of Action Pertaining to the Situation of Social Groups in order to hold a high-level panel discussion on the 30th anniversary of the International Year of the Family. I'm pleased now to invite the Assistant Secretary General for Policy Coordination and Interagency Affairs of the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs, Ms. Maria Francesca Spatulisano, to deliver opening remarks. Ms. Spatulisano, you have the floor. I'm informed that uh, Ms. Patulisano is running late, as a consequence of which we might need to delay the proceedings of the meeting for some time. I seek your indulgence. Thank you. I'm pleased to resume the session again, which we paused very briefly, uh, awaiting our speaker to arrive. She has arrived, so I will reiterate uh, my invitation. Uh, Ms. Uh, Spatulisano, we are very pleased to have you in our midst, and I will now invite you, the Assistant Secretary General for Policy Coordination and Interagency Affairs of the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs, uh, Ms. Maria Francesca Spatulisano to deliver <coughs> opening remarks. You have the floor. Thank you, Chair, and uh, uh, my apologies for late arrival. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor and a privilege to deliver opening remarks at today's high-level panel commemorating the 30th anniversary of the International Year of the Family. The international community has recognized the importance of marking successive anniversaries of the International Year of the Family as a means to addressing the challenges faced by families in a rapidly changing world, offering family-oriented solutions for achieving sustainable development. Families, whatever their shape, are often asked or find themselves acting as the first responders to several stressing novel situations, as well as to many entrenched disparities, be these in the economic or in the social sphere. We know that several mega trends are currently shaping our world and influencing progress towards sustainable development. DESA has contributed to an understanding of their importance for sustainable development with a focus on four topics. 
digital technologies, urbanization, demographic shifts, and climate change. It has been acknowledged that these trends will largely determine the shape of our common future, whether they are harnessed to ensure a more sustainable world or allowed to exacerbate the disparities. Therefore, the importance of understanding these megatrends and addressing their impacts on sustainable development cannot be overstated. The preparations for the International Year of the Families Plus 30 have provided an opportunity to draw attention to the impact on families of these four megatrends and to demonstrate the importance of family-oriented policies in response to such impacts to protect and empower families as agents of development. For families to fulfill this positive role, much is required also from other powerful forces, both public and private actors among them. Let me now discuss some of these megatrends. Over the past decades, rapid technological changes have impacted families in profound ways, especially in terms of work-life balance, worker productivity, and access to education and communication technologies. Yet the growing divide has intensified the challenges faced by vulnerable families and current inequities in access to technologies. The divide often results in knowledge gaps that exacerbate existing gaps and disparities in income, education, employment, and access to housing and health services. Now is the time to ensure that no family and no individual is left behind in this rapid digitalizing world. Second point is migration, as I was saying. As family-related migration is an important component of overall migration, migration policy analysis need to incorporate a family perspective. Moreover, since families socialize and care for younger generations, they should be seen as essential for the integration of migrants into new societies making policies to facilitate family reunifications and social protection for migrants indeed critical for successful integration. Migration in turn fuels rapid urbanization, which can improve the lives of individuals and families when it is a deliberate and sustainable process. When cities are well planned and competently managed they can lift families out of poverty and contribute to social cohesion. All families need adequate and affordable housing, but in reality this has increasingly become an elusive aspiration for many vulnerable families. Reliable and safe transportation and access to education, social service and green spaces where all generations can interact are essential if we wish to make cities and human settlement inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. It is also important to note the impact of climate change on patterns of migration and urbanization. Since extreme weather events such as drought, flood, floods, and wildfires are becoming more frequent and severe, displacing individuals and families, at least temporarily, from their homes and livelihoods, and in some cases, forcing them to migrate in search of new housing and job opportunities. Greater investment in migration aimed at reducing greenhouse gas emissions and in adaptation, focusing um, on helping families adjust to the changing environment is urgently needed to protect vulnerable families. As society evolves, societies evolve, demographic changes impact family structures and dynamics. Demographic transformations need to be acknowledged and anchored in policies based on intergenerational solidarity and support. As interactions across generations tend to foster mutual respect, understanding, and appreciation, intergenerational programs deserve increased recognition and attention. 
the rapid aging of populations pose a challenge for equitable long-term care. Here, a human-centered approach for the provision of care involving governments, business, civil society, communities, and households is needed and should address both paid formal forms of care and unpaid informal care provided by family members. In sum, we must promote and adopt responsive policies and programs. This can help families to deal with the challenges I mentioned, that is the rapid spread of new digital technologies, unprecedented levels of international migration, rapid urbanization, demographic shifts, including rapid population aging, and the broad range of environmental challenges brought about by climate change. As these mega trends are having a considerable impact on the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals, shaping policies in a way that takes into account their impact on families is essential also in order to reach the goals and the targets of the 2030 Agenda. Investing in family-oriented policies and programs helps to build the social and economic capital of individuals and communities recognizing families not only as beneficiaries, but also as agents of development can result in holistic implementation of the 2030 Agenda. Before concluding, I wish to thank all member states, United Nations entities, civil society organizations, academic researchers, and policymakers for supporting the preparation of the 30th anniversary of the International Year of the Family. I also wish to thank the Bureau of the Commission for Social Development for providing this forum for raising awareness of and advo advocating for a family perspective in analyzing the mega trends. And I am convinced that new and innovative family policies in response to the mega trends mentioned here will empower families and help drive future progress towards the Sustainable Development Goals. I encourage all of you to consider the recommendations to be offered by this high-level panel on family-oriented policies, focusing on means of responding to the challenges brought about by the mega trends. And thank you for your commitment and support, and I look forward to hearing your reflections on these important topics. Thank you. Thank you very much. We thank the Assistant Secretary General for Economic and Social Affairs for her statement. I'm pleased to welcome the distinguished panelists of the high-level panel discussion on the 30th anniversary of the International Year of the Family. Mr. Linton Machuno, Acting Director General of the Department of Social Development of South Africa. Ms. Bahira Trask, Professor of Human Development and Family Sciences at the University of Delaware. Ms. Zita Mokomani, Professor and Head of the Department of Sociology at the University of Pretoria. Ms. Susan Walker, Associate Professor Emeritus in the Department of Family Social Science at the University of Minnesota, and Mr. Linton Machuno. I've already taken your name, my apologies, but uh, it's just that we are very pleased with your presence and that we very warmly welcome you to the podium. I'm also pleased to welcome the moderator of today's high-level panel discussion, Mr. John Wilmoth, Officer in Charge and Acting Director of the Division for Inclusive Social Development of the United Nations Department for Economic and Social Affairs. And before I hand the floor over to the moderator, I wish to remind the panelists to please keep within their allotted time limit of 20 minutes per presentation and delegations to keep within the three minute time limit during the interactive discussion. I thank all participants for their understanding. Mr. Wilmoth, over to you. Thank you, Madam Chair. This uh, panel today is organized in observance of the 30th anniversary of the International Year of the Family. In preparation for the observance, UN DESA focused on research on the impact of major megatrends on families. The megatrends identified for analysis over the past three years have been technological change, urbanization, 
migration and demographic change. This year, our focus has shifted to climate change. And thus, the panel will examine the impacts of the megatrends of technological change, migration, urbanization, and demographic trends on families. And it will also explore the linkages between these megatrends and climate change. These trends are the result of human activity, and they exert a major influence on implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. They can be shaped by socioeconomic policies aiming to protect and empower individuals and families. Each panelist will make a roughly 20-minute presentation focusing on the impact of these megatrends on families. They may offer recommendations on family-oriented policies and programs to cope with the challenges of the megatrends with the aim of accelerating implementation of the 2030 Agenda. Once we hear from all the panelists, the floor will be open for participants to make comments or raise questions. So now let us start the the, the panel discussion. I invite first Ms. Bahira Trask, Professor of Human Development and Family Science at the University of Delaware, to be our first speaker. Yes? Good morning, everybody. I would like to thank you for being here. I'm delighted to see that so many of you are interested in family issues. And I think once you hear our presentations, you will see that family is the center. It's foundational to realizing the sustainable development goals and to addressing the mega trends that we're going to talk about. I'd also first like to thank Ms. Renata Kazmierska for organizing this panel and for the commission for inviting us. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about urbanization and migration. It's, they're gone again. Okay. So the, uh, our world has become urban. Historically, throughout all of human nature, we were actually rural. We were first hunters and gatherers, and then around 10,000 years ago, we started to settle down, but most people were living in rural situations. In 2007, there was a turning point in human history because more people were living in cities than they were living in rural areas. And the prediction is that by mid-century, about two-thirds of all of us around the globe are going to be living in urban areas. What is also very important to note is that 90%, so pretty much the whole increase is going to be in Asia and Africa. So I just wanted to show you this graph so you can see the meeting point where it was that we became uh, urban. So what is urbanization? I read a statement recently that said it's difficult to define urbanization, but you know it when you see it. So we're here in New York City. It's clear that New York is an urban area. But what is very interesting is that when you look around the world, urbanization is defined very differently in different parts of the world. And this makes it complicated to discuss what should happen. Uh, towards the end of my presentation, I have a series of recommendations 
for sustainable urbanization, but the complicating factor is that this situation looks very, very different in different parts of the world. So urbanization can be defined by population density, it can be defined by built up areas, commuting density, or in some places it's defined just by the number of people who are not working in agricultural economic activities. In high income areas, 80% of the population is already living in urban areas. But in low income countries, most of the people are still living in rural areas. I uh, just wanted to give you a little bit of a perspective of what all of this looks like. So Tokyo is currently our largest city with 36 million people. Yeah? New York doesn't even qualify as a mega city, just to put this a little bit in perspective. So the importance of urbanization can be seen by the fact that it is a standalone so, uh, sustainable development goal. So goal 11 in the 2030 United Nations agenda focuses on human settlements and on making cities inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. So cities can be a place that bring people together where resources are used efficiently and that can also be a place to promote a peaceful society through the integration of different people. But urbanization does not necessarily always end in that result. This is our ideal result. So urbanization is linked to opportunities. It is a place for economics where people can get, uh, get jobs, um, it, it, the energy is produced there, social life is there. Cities tend to be more diverse than small towns and rural areas. And we have seen an evolution in how cities are developing. So with the Industrial Revolution in the 1800s into the 1900s, there was a focus on manufacturing. These days, that's actually shifting in some, in some parts of the world, and cities are increasingly also becoming places for creative industries. So for example, Berlin these days is known for visual arts, Mumbai for film, Austin, Texas for music and technology, and Seoul, Korea for gaming and digital media. These are just some examples to show that cities and urbanization evolves. It is not a static sort of thing. When cities are well planned, they can lead to greater equity between humans and also to an, a, an increase in the quality of life for individuals. It allows for the exposure to new ideas and to, new, to uh, new lifestyles and to the transmission of values also from people who live in cities to uh, people who live in rural areas, specifically through movement and through technology, which Dr. Walker is going to be talking about in a little bit. So urbanization is very closely linked with migrations. The UN estimates that around 763 million people have, are migrating internally within their own societies. So usually from rural areas to urban areas. Internationally, despite what the news tends to show us, only about 3.6% of the world population is migrating. There are some problems with these statistics because often business travelers and migrants are lumped together. So countries tend to measure who comes in, but they're not necessarily always counting who leaves. And this makes it a little bit complicated. Currently, almost 80 million people have been forcibly displaced across international borders as a result of conflict or natural disasters. Migration and displacement are an urban phenomenon. When people leave one place or are forced to leave a place, they usually go to a city for new opportunities. I do want to point out that almost 97% of people live in their own societies. So again, I just wanted to show you a little bit, just so you have a little overview. Main receiving countries tend to be the United States, Germany, Saudi Arabia, the UK, the Emirates, France, and France. Sending countries, the top sending countries are India, Mexico, China, and the Russian Federation. 
When people move voluntarily, it is to improve their life chances. That is the main reason somebody will leave one place, be it in their own society or across other societies. And migration can potentially improve income, it can improve health, and it can improve educational prospects. I do want to point out that being able to decide where you want to live as a human being is a key element of human freedom. So migration and urbanization are interlinked. And unfortunately, not all migration results in a positive outcome for the individuals who migrate, either forcibly or even voluntarily. Most migrants tend to be poor, and when they move to an urban area, they often settle at the margin, at the edges of the urban center, where they are actually excluded from the social, economic, and political life that is happening in cities. So it is very important to remember that all urbanization and all migration does not look the same. When somebody migrates because a, corp a corporation hires them and sends them to another country, that is a very different type of migration than when someone is forced to leave their home for whatever reason and go to that same country. So understand understanding migration patterns is critical because we need policies and strategies that recognize that the lives and access to opportunities of newly arrived migrants is often very different. It differs, it differs between migrants, but it also differs between the people who are living in urban situation. Adding to the complexity of this issue are the issues of gender. It matters if you're male or female and you're migrating or living in a city, people with disabilities across the life course, and also the situation of older persons. For example, for women, it can be an opportunity to move from a rural area to an urban area because there may be, maybe, access to education and employment, and in certain situations, they may distance themselves from highly patriarchal family and community settings. However, this is not always the case. For example, urban areas provide specific dangers for women and for people with disabilities. They may be harassed in public spaces, they may face violence in public spaces, or also in trans on transportation settings, in schools. We have very little acknowledgement of this is issue. And because of this, they're not able always to access uh, health care, water, uh, medical care, things like that. And they may become, more, in certain parts of the world, they may become more susceptible to sexual trafficking and abuse also in uh, home situations. Clo closely, closely related to urbanization is housing. From my perspective, housing is maybe one of the most important issues that has not been dealt with well at all. H having access to affordable, safe housing is key to family life and to positive child development. There's a lot of research on this, that children need to grow up in safe settings, in houses that are not exposed to too much pollution, have toxic fumes, that sort of thing. And children need a stable family life, however we want to define that. However, migration and this sort of sprawling urbanization that we are seeing in many parts of the world is linked with the problems of slums, unauthorized construction, and haphazard development in these, in these marginal areas. So we see a lot of temporary housing, uh, vulnerable housing, you know, housing built in areas that are not safe, that are susceptible to cli uh, you know, uh, major climate uh, when there's a drought or too much rain, that sort of thing. What is also happening is that unplanned urbanization and housing is, has become the domain of commercial entities that are buying up large tracts of land and 
lots of areas of especially low income housing and they're either not making it available or they're tearing it down and turning it into luxury housing. This issue of housing is a huge problem here in the United States, but it also is in other countries. And by not having access to housing, it makes young people hesitant to partner up and stop their own families. So these issues are interrelated in ways that we don't always, they're not always on our minds. So, um, especially low income families are most affected by the lack of affordable housing and they're faced with substandard housing. This exacerbates poverty because it has effects on the health and on the living environment of the poor. Nearly one billion people around the world are affected by the lack of affordable housing. They're living in two cramped conditions, in dangerous neighborhoods. They tend to stay inside, which influences their health. And like I said, especially for young children, this is very, very detrimental to their growth and becoming healthy adults. It also affects individuals with disabilities and older people. How do we know this? There's actually a burgeoning uh, research field on health and, and, and the conditions in urban areas that are detrimental to people's health. So we're seeing that respiratory and neurological disorders are on the rise. We're seeing developmental delays in children. Um, Particularly, we're seeing a lot of mental health issues, and mental health, I want to point out, is also a significant problem in uh, many mi migrating communities, because people leave their communities behind, their support systems, and now they are alone in new places. Also, this being in cramped quarters, uh, this, we've seen a rise in domestic violence, and there's less social interaction because people are afraid to, live, to leave where it is that they are living. So all of this is tied to climate change. Scientists predict that the temperature niche for humans is going to become so much hotter in the 50 years, more than it has over the last 6,000 years. We are already seeing some of this. I don't know if you watched the news this week and saw what happened in Los Angeles with the incredible rainstorm, which is very unusual for them. One third of the human population, one third, is going to experience the heat that is currently only experienced by 0.8% currently. And we're going to see, like I said, this increase in storms, droughts, and other extreme weather events. I recently heard a very depressing uh, report on NPR, that's one of our uh, radio stations here, that we are only at the beginning of uh, migrants uh, leaving because of climate change, that in the next 25 years, that is going to be the major driver of migration, is going to be these weather events. The people who will be most affected by this are people, people living off the land, who make their living and, uh, by growing things where they won't be able to grow things anymore, and families that live in vulnerable areas, that live next to rivers and that sort of thing. Mega cities in developing countries are most at risk of climate change and migration. The big problem is there is no infrastructure to sustain a lot of these people. So they have to leave, they move to these big cities, but there's not enough, there's not enough housing, there's not enough healthcare, there are not enough educational opportunities for this, you know, children, that sort of thing especially cities that are by coastal locations, which most mega cities are in some form, they are going to be the ones affected by climate change. Also, climate change and urbanization have specific gender effects. Again, something that we tend not to think about. So, like I said, moving to an urban area can be positive with new ideas for gender roles for women, but an interesting and disturbing phenomenon is that in certain places in the world where families are forced to move because of climate change, they're migrating, they're actually marrying their daughters off at younger ages because they're worried about what's going to happen when they get to an urban area if their daughter is not 
married. So we're actually seeing an increase in child marriage instead of a decrease. So it's going in the wrong direction. And as I said, also climate change and urbanization and migration are all linked to men increasing mental health issues. And again, that is detrimental to family formation and the stability of family life. We're only at the beginning of understanding these linkages. And we know a little bit from some parts of the world, for example, in Central America, as the temperature has been going up, coffee growers are not able to, uh, to grow coffee beans anymore, and though they are starting to move. So when people move, this is associated with a loss of social support, the fragmentation of families, they have to leave people behind. They have to try to figure out a new livelihood in a new urban area, and they may also have a personal dilemma in terms of losing their identity in a new setting. They basically have to recreate their lives. So what can be done? Yeah, we don't need to just discuss all the depressing things that are happening. There are actually solutions to some of these problems. So first, when we're talking about climate change and migration and urbanization, development programs need to be taking these issues into account, and especially what are the livelihoods of local populations. I think these are very local issues. We can't just say everyone around the world should be doing this. It doesn't work that way. We need investments in irrigation, in infrastructure, and training. People need new skill sets so that they don't migrate. I'm a big believer in prevention. Let's try to address the issues before they happen. Also, we need to strengthen social security programs and community level supports. I mentioned gender. Gender needs to be incorporated into these programs. So, for example, women need separate shelters with protected toilets and bath areas so that they are safe when they are, for example, living in a camp or in a new urban area, that sort of thing. We need childcare so, uh, so that adults who have migrated are able to learn new skills. Yeah? They, they need some way of dealing with their family tasks. And we need targeted skill building programs that are suited to varying differential skill sets for individuals who move to urban areas. The perspectives of local governments should be integrated into international discussions. As I said before, one solution doesn't fit everybody. So we need, we need to know what is happening on the ground, and then we can use that also as best practice examples, sort of a, a sharing of ideas. We need to institute more widespread participatory processes in urban and rural areas to facilitate poverty eradication. And we need more coordination between urban, regional, national, and international development planning. In particular, we need to add re recent migrants into urban planning councils. People need to understand what are the needs of these new people coming in, not just the established citizens of a city. Um, we, uh, I've said all of these things, but I also want to emphasize we should also include older per people and individuals with disabilities into planning processes. Um, we need to move more towards the institution of universal okay, protection systems, especially vulnerable populations in conflict zones and in di natural disaster areas are often overlooked. We don't re realize what their needs are, and especially for people who have family members with disabilities. There's a lot of research that shows that cash and in-kind transfers and subsidies are a proven mechanism for supporting families. Housing, I've already mentioned, I want to emphasize it again, a fundamental human right is to have a safe and comfortable house where they can live. Housing is foundational to sustaining and promoting family life, and this can be furthered by having a mixture of public and private partnerships to create mixed income housing. 
family life ultimately is supported by having mixed income housing, reliable transportation, uh, pedestrian friendly streetscapes and green areas. We are actually in a lot of places reducing green areas when we should be increasing green areas. Um, I've talked about this, we, we need to focus on women and individuals dis with disabilities and their specific needs, for example, for accessing healthcare and for accessing jobs. Ultimately, what we really need are coordinated responses in order to reach the most vulnerable individuals. Um, we need to incorporate a life course perspective into the programs and policies that we create. And I have a list of examples. I'm going to skip it because I'm out of time. Um, Well-planned urban areas can decrease social inequalities and promote family life, and that ultimately leads to more peaceful societies. And I also want to add in as a last point that we need to not look at migrants as burdens or as victims, but instead as individuals who bring capabilities and talents to the places where they are. And we need to be thinking about programs and policies that help develop those capabilities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Trask, for this excellent presentation. And I now would like to give the floor to Ms. Zita Mokomane, the professor and head of the Department of Sociology at the University of Pretoria in South Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, like my, uh, my colleague, uh, Ms. Trask, has said, I'm very happy to be here. And thank you very much to the commission and DESA for organizing this. I really appreciate the attendance that I'm seeing today because it shows that we are not alone in believing that the family is really the foundation of, of society, one of the essential sectors or that no society can function with efficiently. So thank you, and I think we'll have a really, looking forward to a more uh, vibrant debate on how we take this forward. Um, I, I'm going to talk about um, demographic trends, one of the mega trends that, ha that were identified that uh, as part of the International Year of the Family, the 30th anniversary. And I just want to start by saying that just over a year ago, in November 2022, the world reached a milestone, 8 billion people. And I remember when I was studying demography in the early 90s, we were told that we're going to reach 7 billion, and it was a major, <laughs> uh, ooh, ooh, do remember, but we are still here, and we don't feel overcrowded, and I will talk about that. And commenting on what he called the milestone in human development, the UN Secretary General there said this was an equation of to celebrate, and rightly so. Why? Because it, among other things, it showed that we have made advancements in health, and we have... Um, extended lifespans and life expectancy. And the longer we live, the more we, we celebrate, and I, I think. And this has been one of the trends that we have seen over the years was reduced mortality, especially maternal and maternal mortality. So even though advancements in health were uh, one of the underlying factors, there are other factors that also uh, played a major role. We have also seen a decline in fertility rates, and I'll talk more about that. And to some extent, migration that Ms. Uh, Truss was just talking about also played a role. So these um, three processes, fertility, mortality, and migration, are what we call demographic processes of population change. The way they, whether they can either increase or decrease population change, and we'll talk about that. And these, there are changes in them, changes in them, is what we call demographic trends, and that's what one of the mega trends that we are interested in. Um, just the, what conceptually to say that fertility demographically is the average number of children per woman over a lifetime, and it refers to the product or output of reproduction rather than the physiological ability to have children. So uh, demographically, we talk about live births when we talk about fertility. Mortality is the total number of deaths in a population, and migration, like what you just heard, is the geographic movement of people across a, specific bound, bound, a specified boundary. And usually, the purpose should be a permanent or semi-permanent uh, residence. So if you just visit, it's not migration. And we heard that sometimes because the statistics get uh, soiled as business travelers or tourists are, are identified as migrants. By migrants, you are going to 
live in a different place, either permanently or semi-permanently. So why are these the uh, demographic processes of fertility, mortality, and migration important? They're important because all of them occur in families. They're important for policy making, but for the purpose of this meeting, we'll say that they're important because all of them occur in families. And I really think this um, quotation by Susan Selzer really uh, succinctly uh, summarizes it. The motivation to have a child the consequences of losing a parent or a spouse or a child, and when children, when people move out to new locations are all family experiences. They happen in family, and family decisions are usually underlie them. <laughs> the health of people, uh, care taken takes place within families. Labor force participation takes, people usually go into the labor force to support their families, and the way they structure their working conditions, their working times are usually also influenced by their family structure and family circumstances. Whether you move, the first thing you do is probably think of your family. How is it going to impact your wider family and, and, and nuclear family? So really, uh, everything that we, we are or what we do usually occurs in the families, and that's where fertility, the number of births, mortality, migration are all important for family, for family and for this international year of the family. So I'm going to talk about uh, the demographic, the impact of these processes on fertility. And I'm just only going to focus on two, fertility on my, and mortality because migration has been covered. But in the discussions, I'm happy to talk about it. So fertility levels can generate Fertility in this day, the number of children that w women have can generate either benefits or costs for society, and it depends. So it's, it's either neither good nor bad. It will depend on the context. Uh, it, and these uh, benefits or costs can be captured within the family or it can spill over and influence the wider society. One of the basic uh, theories in demographic research on fertility is Becker's theory on the quantity and quality trade-off. And he says that high fertility or the high, the high quantity of children can lead to strained family budgets, can be bad in a way that it's very difficult to support a, a large family. And it means that a family with a high quantity of children have fewer resources, resources for the children's human capital development, for education, for nutrition, for health, and so on, and vice versa. Families with low, uh, fewer children are more likely to afford or to invest in the human capital of children. There are debates, to pro, there are people who think there are pro and cons of that uh, theory, but that's one way, perspective. Others view, view low fertility that um, with a lower fertility, you are also able to invest in the human capital development because parents, especially mothers who are primary caregivers or women, are more likely to have a participate in the labor force because they have lower care giving, child care given responsibilities. And the earnings that they have, researchers so that is typically spent on children, on human capital, also on resources that can take families out of poverty and overall improve family well-being. So that's one advantage, if you want to say, of lower fertility. On the other hand, high fertility, especially in developing regions or in societies where they are very limited or no social support, social protection systems, high fertility can be seen as a, social, a form of social safety. Extended family we have seen in many African and South Asian countries where the extended family is the dominant family structure that uh, care for children, care for older people, care for people, uh, people, uh, family members with disabilities or those who are not well, usually is taken care by the, 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 the family. And this quotation also that by the boss I like because he said, at the very least, if you don't have social safety net, an individual minimizes the chance of ending up without care by having as many children as possible. So the more children, the better. There are more resources to, to take. And what uh, the implication there is that with low fertility, it means that eventually families will have will be burdened with uh, caregiving, especially in older ages when people need more care. 
Lower fertility also, also weakens emotional and physical support as well as companionship networks for older people as well for younger family members. Here we talk about socialization and intergenerational relationships that lower, uh, high, um, bigger families tend to, to have that more what we call social capital. And then decrease uh, fertility, on the other hand, compromises social cap family capital, the source of material and other resources. So uh, in a family where fertility is lower, the capacity of individuals to function and attain current or future goals seems to be compromised as well. Um, these are just some of the demographic trends on family. Yeah, nothing, it's all uh, perspectives, like I said, it could be positive, it could be negative, it just, uh, it could be seen as benefits or cause depending on the context. Um, the other demographic trend on mortality, yeah, the family effect of mortality can be explained through the, what we call the social gra gradient of health perspective, where we say that members of families with higher socioeconomic st status tend to have healthier lifestyles because they, are, they have greater access to flexible resources. So what it just basically means is that socioeconomic status is more likely to give you the resources to attain better quality health care, better quality nutrition and more and so on and you are more likely, we are all not going to um, avoid mortality death at some point, but it might just reduce the, probably the factors that, that give risk to, to, to poor health, illness and maybe premature death. But when you talk about the impact of mortality on the family, when someone dies in the family, it doesn't matter who it is, there are usually shifts in the family dy dynamics. It depends also, and also changes the roles and the identity of family members. Let's say a breadwinner dies. If they, they die, it means that the role, someone has to take up that uh, breadwinner uh, uh, role. The identity of people changes. Um, when a parent loses a child, the identity somehow does change and those kind of things. So mortality does impact the family in, in that way. It also restructures the relationship between family members because of those role changes and identities and has also been shown to increase gender inequality within families, especially in the cases of maternal mortality where defined roles that render men usually are unable to assume household responsibilities. If a mother or a primary female caregiver dies and the male caregiver, a male has to step in as a caregiver, sometimes those are the gender dynamics that come into play there. And also can decrease women's productive labor force participation or also, also increase it. So it all really links to the second bullet point, the role and identities of family members are affected by mortality. One of the other major and well-documented impact of uh, mortality on families uh, have been recognized when you talk about widowhood. In, nine, in 20, 2015, the Lumba Foundation did a, a global study that came up with very, very com uh, compelling evidence of a number of societal injustices, discrimination, and half of <laughs> cultural rights throughout the world in both developed and developing countries that show how it impacts the quality of life and deprives widows and their children in many countries of, of the world, especially when the death of a husband can endanger the very existence of a household. There are lots of injustices there and I urge you to all read that report. Um, inheritance rights, the loss of family rights, uh, uh, what is it? yeah inheritance and things like that is all uh, set out in that report and one of the common widowhood strategies which is remarriage can restore can either uh, restore pre widowhood socioeconomic and emotional conditions of widows and their children and can be benefit in that way because it takes back the person to that but one what has been found a lot is that it can also create what we call blended families and, and step families which also have positive and negative implications for for family functioning as well as for child and youth well be uh, we can talk about this when we are talking I'm just looking at the time and also in the background report on which this presentation is based, I explain much more there. I want to go now straight to 
as we recall all those potential impacts of mortality and mortality, to look at what has been happening since 1994, we are in, uh, celebrating the 30th anniversary of the International Year of the Family, which was portrayed in 1994. So 30 years later, what has been the trends in, in, in these demographic processes? We see that around 1990, women had a, on average three children per, there were three children per woman. And in 2021, which is the most recent year, this had decreased to about 2.3. And then we can see that in about um, 25 years, there will still be a decrease in fertility. So basically what he's saying is that fertility, there is a global decline in fertility across the world. And um, even in Sub-Saharan Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa still remains the world region with the highest fertility level, but still even there, it's still decreasing, even though it's higher. One of the major things from the from the table there that I want us to focus on is uh, demographically, a total fertility rate of 2.1 is what we call replacement level fertility. And it's a fertility level where if it's, you reach that level, the, the population will be able to replace itself. That's why we call it replacement level fertility. Anything below that is a cause for concern because it means that not enough people, enough children are being born. And eventually, there are serious long-term uh, consequences for elder care, for even structurally, for economic productivity and all those things. And we see that happening a lot in many countries of the global north and the and or developing countries. And you can see that in 2021, about three world regions were already below replacement level fertility, South and Eastern and Southeast Asia, Australia, New Zealand, uh, Europe, and North America. And the trend is that in about 2050, this would have been increased to around five. So what is saying that we are having low, less and less sharing, and this will have important policy uh, implications going forward. So at the structural level, negative consequences could be economic growth, national service, savings and government budgets will be affected by this. And what we are seeing is countries, especially in the global north, really trying to implement pro-fertility policies to encourage women mostly to have more children. Uh, when I teach, I teach a course on demography, health, and society, and I usually share with my students some of what we call the just flowery uh, initiatives in other parts of the world, very interesting. And that's all we can do. It's a cal it takes time for fertility to, to decrease, and it's also going to take time, really a struggle to ask people to have more children. So very innovative uh, program. But one of, uh, in, for the current purpose, pro-fertility policies can also undermine human rights and achievement or relevant targets such as SDG3 and things. Some of them are really forceful, if you want to say. And um, the incentive that come with it are in a way f uh, pressurizing women to have children and, 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 and so on, and leaving their human rights or over, over, um, overlooking their human rights, not directly, but indirectly, and also gender equality in terms of labor participation and so on. Uh, this trends can also be um, a reflection of shift in related family life and low fat, uh, uh, what we call the second demographic transition, where they are just shifting values with higher education and people seeing that uh, they are not necessarily depending on children for the old age support that I was talking about earlier, old age security that I was talking about. We don't no longer, no longer have to have as many children as our predecessors. So it can just be a, a, a cultural shift. And there's um, trends also in, on the impact on the, is that as, uh, one of the major determinants of fertility, what you call the proximate determinant of fertility, is union, union status. Women who are married or in union who are cohabiting are more likely to have more children than those who, their counterparts who haven't. So marriage trends, nuptiality trends also are a major uh, 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 factor that we consider when we are talking at uh, demographic trends. So how many women are married, how many, what, the family structures, union formation, what, uh, how that is. And then 
With fertility declining, we see that uh, it also changes traditional. We see a lot of tra tra uh, non-traditional families, high levels of cohabitation, number of um, children born out of wedlock or to single parents, and this most of this in many societies lack the legal protections versus the married counterparts. And these are challenges for family functioning, family stability, and psychosocial well-being of uh, of families. Challenges of fem female single parents families, most, majority of whom are headed by women have been uh, widely documented and can include uh, individual problems, work family conflict, especially where in nuclear families where the extended family is not involved in child care and or elder care, intrafamily problems and social problems such as stigma, social insecurity, isolation, exclusion, uh, uh, social exclusion and so forth, like the widowhood I was talking about. Another trend, even though the, uh, the, uh, the, there is a global decline in, in uh, fertility levels, we are seeing also uh, an increase in adolescent fertility in many parts of uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America and the, and, the, and the Caribbean. And one of the common early factors there, which is of concern and I think uh, Ms. Trust talked about was early marriage or, or child marriage, where at least one of the, of the parties is less than 18 years. And child sexual abuse is one of the other major underlying factors of this, of, of this trend. So it's a concern because socially and also health-wise, children born to adolescent mothers are more likely to be born preterm, have a low, lower birth rate, higher neonatal mortality. Young mothers are also less likely to have also um, survive, survive, maternal survival issues, but also social issues, less likely to complete high school or more likely to live in, in poverty. Because again, when we did, we did a study in South Africa, you show that majority of the fathers of this maternal mothers are not involved in the child's health. Then uh, mortality, I started by saying, and that table is just showing that uh, what we are celebrating in the, in the first thing, that in the first slide, that life expectancy has been decreasing, increasing over the last 30 years, and that's something that we should be uh, happy about. But the impact of family, the, so I talked about the, some of the, uh, the impact of mortality on families, and I won't repeat that, but with the mortality, we are happy that it's increasing. We saw in the last, with the pandemic, when mortality slightly increased, but then with interventions, it has, it has come down. So when we look at the fertility and mortality rates, the decrease in, fer in fertility, the increase in mortality, these combined together, they cause another or lead to another factor, demographic factor that we cannot ignore of population aging. A number of, because of that we see that population is aging across the world. It is already evident in the developed countries, but even in developing countries we are, we are, we are seeing that. So this is another trend that we have to look out for. And I see that I'm, <laughs> uh, I'm going to run out of time and we'll discuss. And we are, I'm going to talk about uh, climate change is a cross-cutting issue that we have to talk about. Uh, it's much more direct. I think the linkages are there, much more direct when you talk about urbanization and migration. But uh, I just put this quotation because I thought it, 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 um, it summarizes what we can think about when you're talking about fertility and, my, uh, and mortality. And like Ms. Trust said, we're only at the beginning. The linkage between fertility and mortality and migration is still at the beginning. I think this is a debate that we have to talk, do, put more, invest in more research to talk about it and find out the, the direct linkages. But when we're talking about mortality, for example, some of the climate change effects of climate change, like floods, if we have floods, if we have, we might need more directly, can more directly influence mortality. With fertility, I'm not sure, and I'm happy to, 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 to go into the debate with uh, of that. Recommendation, just quickly, we just uh, remember that all demographic events occur within families, and one of the major recommendation is that uh, it has to, whatever interventions we put must be intersectoral, and I agree also that a life course 
intersectoral um, uh, intervention should put should be put in place, and they should focus more on family units rather than individual family members because that plays a major role. We have social protection policies in many African countries, for example, but most of them are just focused on the, on, on individual family members. For example, if you have a child support a grant, it's uh, the target is a child, and it's very good and has been shown that actually it does benefit the, 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 the entire family. But once the child uh, migrates or becomes an adult, that means the whole family now goes back to poverty. So we should look at those kind of things. Or uh, old age grant, for example, they've been used a lot to sustain families, but when the older person passes away, then the family is left. Um, yeah, put in place interventions to address all those high levels of adolescent fertility, social protection, should, policy should be strengthened and social security, expand social health insurance coverage for improved mortality, protect the rights of non-traditional family unions, the rights of widows and their children, and again, re invest in research to further understand how current and future demographic change and climate change will impact families. What type of families are more at risk? Which in interventions are possible and more urgent, for example? I'll stop there and look forward to more discussions in this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Mokomarme, for this very interesting presentation. And I would now like to give the floor to Ms. Susan Walker, Associate Professor Emeritus of uh, Family Social Science at the University of Minnesota. Good morning. Um, it is an absolute pleasure um, to be with this esteemed panel um, and an honor uh, to be here today. Um, thank you very much and thank you to the UN and to DESA for um, having us all together to talk about um, what is I think the most important to all of us, which is the family. Um, so, um, can I take your phone for the week? No. Um, so, somebody will be posted at the door, just pass them on down. We'll just collect them in a basket, and I, I'll, I'll come back to New York and I'll return your phones. <laughs> so, just let that sit just for a second to really for you to consider what you would lose by not having this in your possession 24-7. And my job here is done. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, but one of the exercises, I mentioned this at our, our meeting yesterday, one of the exercises that I will do with my undergraduate students in our technology in the family course is to ask them to pull out their phones and they identify all the different functions that they can perform on the phone. Uh, not just communication, these are walking computers, they are entertainment devices, um, they help us navigate, they provide, we can exchange money, pretty much everything we want to do in our daily life, we can do with this phone and we can do it on demand. So you can just begin to get a bit of a sense of, um, of the importance of technology in family life. We are now in what is considered the tertiary phase of the information age. We have learned a lot, but believe me, we are just scratching the surface of what we need to know about the impact of information and communications technology and its impact on individuals as well as its impact on communities and the societies that individuals live in. In the last 25 years, we now have nearly ubiquitous use of the internet and smartphone ownership in most continents um, that impact, again, individuals, families, and wider structures. Um, they have reduced space and time barriers. We certainly learned that with COVID. Um, and offering efficiencies and tools for communication, productivity, and learning. Our research to date does um, support the value of information and communication technology to family life and human development, and yet it has also identified threats 
through exposure, security, and privacy breaches, heightening the challenge to those living especially in high-risk conditions. So uh, again, obviously further research is needed to identify processes and actual, not just correlational and how one thing relates to the other, but, but actual impacts and strategies so that we can support the family. This quote from uh, the National Academy of Sciences six, uh, seven years ago now, um, still I believe holds um, very true. The ultimate effects of technology will be determined by the technical capabilities. So what these devices, what our technology can do, AI, smart homes, you name it, and how it's used. So not just what it can do, but how it's used and how we prepare and respond to the shifts in our demographic change, our urbanization, our migration patterns, our climate change, and especially how these all intersect with ICT. So I'm going to use more of an ecological model to frame both my observations as well as policy um, because I look at individuals within families, but I also believe very strongly, not just the technology obviously is used within families, um, but it's also in the context in which families live and the broader macro level context such as policy um, that can affect family. Two major issues um, transcend all of the context. The first one is, is equity. As we're identifying the value of, the, of information communication uh, technology devices, their functions, their on-demand availabilities, we also have to, to identify that it is not equal. Not all people have access to the same technology, to the same quality of technology. Um, and so it's, it's very, very important that we identify not only access, but also what various contexts can mean to people's comfort in using technology, right? And into who all has access. So individual families may, but what about seniors? And especially what about those with disabilities? So when we talk about equity, we really need to be considering everyone. And finally, um, time. Time across um, the spheres definitely has an impact on our understanding of technology. Um, compared to, to my colleagues and their, um, their comments today, our understanding of information and communications technology is a relatively brief um, exploration. Um, in the last 20 years, We've gone to using these kinds of phones um, and to uh, the latest um, version of the iPro 15, right? So when you think about the phones that we used in 2004 um, and even a little bit bef before then, they pretty much were talking devices. They just gave us mobility and then a very rough connection to the internet and now we can do everything. Right, we practically don't even need our, our laptop computers or anything else. Uh, for children, back in 2004, this is what their internet looked like. They were, it was much more of a, of a read-only type of environment. Um, I'll tell you that in, when 9-11 hit in 2001, I was in my office at the University of Maryland, and the way that I tracked what was going on was from scrolling through web pages and refreshing, and refreshing <laughs> to see the latest updates or having the radio on. Can you imagine? Um, this is the way children are learning now. They are um, devices for their learning are interactive, are virtual, and, and artificial intelligence is informing the way that they're learning, not only in classrooms, but in the wider context of children's lives. We also, in terms of equity, while the majority, so about little, almost three quarters of, of people um, do have access to a mobile phone, we also see that there are differences. So with, um, with Europe and with the Americas, there's uh, almost 95% uh, of views. Um, and so it varies by continent. It also varies by country's uh, economic um, prowess, 
and as and um, so there is um, there are inequities. So again, uh, we need to consider the rapid change of technology. And I will tell you as a researcher, that's one of the biggest challenges that we face in, in observing how technology is used, understanding its, its impacts and reporting those out so that as a public, we can do something about it because it's changing so rapidly that the data that we collect, right, by the time that it's analyzed and reported, People have moved on and they're, and they're going, oh, that's nice. We don't use that anymore. So starting from the individual, um, we'll, we'll focus on within the family and individual development. Um, now, now, for those of us who do human development work, this is a very, 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 very broad category, right? So we're not just, we're talking about the, the focus on uh, which type of development? Is it physical development? Is it cognitive development? Is it psychosocial? And for which age of children? Because they, they rapidly change, right? From the first five years through middle childhood into uh, different phases of adolescence. And let's not forget the adults, right? Let's not forget seniors. So we don't stop growing <laughs> and changing and developing. So we are, um, so when we talk about the impact of, of ICT on development, um, I have to ask for who and at what time and in which way. So it's, it's not just a general category. Uh, some of the areas of concern that have been identified, and I will say that, that one of the focus on children is that um, they, they seem to get the greatest amount of press when it comes to the use of technology. Um, and so some of the areas have to do with sleep, with distraction from learning, um, the possible addictions, obesity uh, from being more sedentary, obviously bullying, damage to mental health, exposure to harmful images, uh, security, privacy breaches, exposure to online predators. So you would read that and you would go, oh my gosh, why would we even use these, right? Mm -hmm. But the important fact is we're focusing on some of the, the negatives is that this, our technology, I just asked you if you get rid of your phones. You won't. It's so much a part of our lives that we have to learn how to live with technology. It's not an either or. We also have to embrace the great value that ICT offers to human development, opportunities for learning and engagement that we've never seen before creativity, collaboration. It's particularly valuable when I, I see the way that, that young adults and, and adolescents are giving voice to what matters to them and showing their creativity through their use of technology and, and social media, their personal expression, and cultivating the types of skills that they are going to use as adults. All of us that were sort of our digital um, immigrants and are learning as we go, the children of today are bringing those skills in with them. Within the family as well, then, it's not only the individual, but we have parents. And we, we, so we look at entire families, but we also look at relationships in dyad. So if we think about parents and we think about parents and children, the impact of technology there is of course it helps parents communicate with their children, but it's given parents a whole new topic now mm -hmm. um, in terms of you know money management and learning to drive a car and being a good citizen. Now parents have to raise their children responsibly with the use of, of um, technology. And it's very hard for them. They don't have a lot of, they certainly didn't grow up with it the way that children are now. And, and we also know that one of the biggest factors in how parents parent is the confidence that they have in child rearing. And many parents, when it comes to information and communications technology, because it's not like, oh, well, I learned how to drive a car, so I can teach you how to drive a car. They're trying to keep up with this ever-changing information and communication technology in ways that it's not familiar to them. Yeah. Um, and so many parents do feel very, very insecure um, about this. 
And then again, focusing within the family, we know that the family very much is a, is a culture and a context for how children, how the whole family uses technology. From the families that have very strict values about, um, about the way the technology is used to, as you can see in this picture, everybody's on their devices sort of alone together, right? Um, and, but we also see it as a great vehicle for the kinds of things that uh, keep families together, that help families be cohesive uh, through communication, especially any of, how many of you use WhatsApp, right? Well, we all do, right? And it's a great way to connect with people around the world. Um, it's a way for, um, to maintain our intergener intergenerational relationships. It's a, ways, it's a way for families to start dating apps, right? For people to find each other and to form connections. But through that, it's also a potential source of conflict. And so, um, and so it's, it's something that in our world of, of family studies, we, we, work, we talk a lot with undergraduates about how do you manage conflict when one of you uses a phone differently than someone else. So for families, especially during migration, we also see it as um, ICT as a great benefit. The successful integration of migrants requires that their technological integration is as important as social, political, and economic integration traditionally reported in the scientific literature, meaning that as we're providing um, families who are migrating with a range of services, we also need to attend to their, um, their ability to have access to phones and also the security of their, um, of their connections because human trafficking is, um, is salient. So we know that families during migration will use it for social connections um, and making connections to the society that they're moving to, to families, also once they're there to help them integrate into society and also so that they have more of a representation now in maybe not our visible use of ICT but in the data that we collect. So we, our, our data systems for migration have become much more sophisticated. So of just a few very brief policies related to individual and family well-being. Um, first, centers on research. Uh, we, again, we need it to continue. And as you see in these, you know, very broad, very, um, you know, sp and also specific areas of human development, it needs to, it needs to continue. Um, but I would say be far more representative my colleague who was here yesterday, my colleagues from UNICEF and ITU, I really applaud the global work that they're doing f so that we have more understanding of the way ICT is used, yeah. not just in the quote unquote weird countries that are um, economic, economically advantaged, but really have an understanding of its youth by individuals and within families and their societies worldwide. So it needs to be far more representational. Um, we need far more global resources to help families, especially help parents, um, be able to navigate. Um, as, uh, and I have one source here. This is from the American Academy of Pediatrics. Um, and then also, again, obviously equitable access. So the next fear is not outside the family because the context that families operate in greatly influence their use of technology, their need for technology, and their demand on um, the amount of technology that they use. Um, so those fears include work. Um, and again, we can see this with COVID, how our use of technology at home and at work um, has really broken down space and time barriers. Um, when we go to work anymore, it's, it's um, maybe just going from our bedroom to the, <laughs> to the dining room. Um, and, um, and so we've seen great efficiencies when, when workers are polled about if they would prefer to work at home, many of them say they do, right? Because it produces so many efficiencies and they're able to manage the multiple roles of parent, of worker, of volunteer, of caretaker for seniors, the many roles that parents have in their lives, um, they, parents prefer to be working from home because now they can manage those, um, those roles more efficiently. The problem, though, is stress. 
because when you break down those traditional barriers of time and space as you would have when you quote unquote go to work, that also means that on your own, you need to manage all of those roles. Mm -hmm. So you can be focused at a, a business meeting and your, um, and your children need um, a second peanut butter and jelly sandwich, right? And so it's, 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 that's a new stress for a lot of families is role demand. Um, also in terms of school, Obviously, and this is a huge, huge topic of children learning in schools, the technology access that they have in schools, the way that schools are integrating um, ICT in, in learning, um, and also what children are learning um, about the use of ICT, and specifically when we think about social relationships and bullying. Bullying doesn't happen alone al online, right? It, it can be a continuation of place-based kinds of behavior. Um, this is, again, a very, very large topic that I'm, I'm needing to uh, summarize quickly. Um, but one of the things that we do see um, as being a challenge with schooling is the inequitable access in schools. So the amount of technology and the amount of uh, comfort that teachers have using technology in schools varies greatly. Um, in terms of you figure anything that families interact with in terms of their health care, their money management, um, their, um, their uh, uh, consumer, their, their purchasing, all relates to and depends almost exclusively now on their access to ICT. Um, one of the things, excuse me, one of the, um, one of the things that we're identifying too is it's not enough just to prepare and to present, you know, your, your, um, uh, your service on the web, um, but also, you know, how secure are those um, privacy and safety through the types of, of uh, links that um, uh, f uh, financial and health agencies are providing. Um, if you think about, was it Equifax just a few years ago? You know, your sense of security when it comes to using the internet drops re um, remarkably. So while they are efficient, we also are very concerned about privacy and safety uh, with these types of um, areas. Um, and then also in terms of urbanization and smart cities, um, we, definitely, oops, we definitely have seen um, uh, tremendous efficiencies with smart cities. Um, in terms of just the ability to get around. Um, you know, we're all using our phone now to buy um, metro tickets, um, to be able to, to um, uh, pay our electric bills. And, um, and again, the other part of urbanization is that the data that we're able to collect um, is we're is able to plan urban life much more easily for families um, to be efficient and to be tailored or human-centered um, because of the data that we're able to generate. Um, and then um, the, other, the other aspect of the family context that is near and dear to my heart, but I also think it goes very under-attended to, are those professionals who work in those contexts who work with families. Mm -hmm. So. We're very focused on the family and, and we look at you know, access and, and things like that. We're looking at global policies, but the middle ground are those individuals who work with families who are so important to family life. They're so important to the way that they understand how to use technology. They're very important to using technology in their own delivery of service. And I found, okay. And I found in my um, own work with um, educators especially that they are um, oftentimes ill-prepared. It depends on where they work. They um, oftentimes prepare, use their own devices. They have to train themselves on using technology. And, and so when they're, um, as I mentioned yesterday, in the design of some, some technology for a parenting education program, the design was the easy part. It was the implementation because many of the practitioners didn't feel comfortable and the administrators didn't believe it was important. So, so it's very important that we attend to those professionals as well. Um, and so some of the community level policy in terms of, again, providing uh, quality, uh, quality resources, 
technical assistance, um, making sure that those family professionals who work with individuals um, possess confidence, uh, competence and comfort in their own use um, because they'll transmit messages. And those are also folks that family members trust a great deal. Um, and then again, um, privacy and safety. <coughs> Three macro level policy areas involve access, digital liter literacy, privacy, and safety. So from a standpoint of access, there we go. Um, one of this, um, there's one of the things that we've now moved to, our understanding of the use of technology is um, so broad and, um, and much more complex that we're not just looking at um, which countries provide internet access or who has access to phones, but, um, but we have more of a digital well-being score uh, that can relate to affordability, the quality of the internet, the e-infrastructure and um, e-security, and how well the government is using technology to reach people. And, um, um, and in this case, the lighter shaded countries are the ones who have higher digital well-being scores. But it isn't just those with, that are economically well off. Um, there are some individual countries that despite their GDP are really making great efforts in this way. Um, <coughs> so, <coughs> sorry, um, internet is a basic human right, um, protecting the online spaces. As, um, as ways that we can promote the um, SDGs. There we go. Um, a few privacy and safety um, examples. I'm not gonna go through these for the sake of time. Um, I will do a plug, <laughs> a shameless plug, for actually a free, um, a free open access textbook that um, I have written um, that um, I brought these because I knew time would be limited and this is a way to access a lot of information that I've discussed today, only in more depth. So some um, safety and policy examples. Oops, sorry. Um, digital literacy, as the UNICEF has said, to embed digital literacy along with other skills. This needs to start early and really consider the wide range, again, of the way all families are using technology. So we have challenges, again, as, as I've, I've identified, and needs, we need more of everything, more rigor, um, better research, more internet access. Um, and again, I believe that if, when we consider more of an ecological perspective to our policies. Um, the final thing, and I'm, I'll, do, I'll do this quickly, um, and I can summarize this fairly quickly. Again, this is, with climate change, this is a, an, another a huge area of needed research. Um, one is that we know on the positive side that as we are uh, traveling less, we're spending, you know, we have more um, of our uh, work from home. The carbon emissions have, have reduced um, and that there are some really wonderful examples of the ways that uh, companies have utilized technology to help to offset carbon emissions. Um, on the other hand, um, the tech companies themselves are um, uh, using quite a bit and they need to be much more carefully monitored for the amount of, of carbon emissions that they're producing. And so not only should we be looking at their efforts and going, oh, well, that's nice, but they need to be monitored. So with that um, and my time being up, thank you very much. I thank Mrs. Ms. Susan Walker for her excellent presentation. And I would now like to give the floor to Mr. Linton Machuno the Acting Director General of the National Department of Social Development of the Republic of South Africa. Well, thank you very much, uh, moderator, and let me join my fellow panel members in appreciating DESA for convening such an important uh, panel uh, as we discuss the 30th anniversary of the International Year uh, of the Family. Coincidentally, this year, South Africa commemorates 30 years of democracy following the end of apartheid, which of course was a system that institutionalized the segregation of population groups between black, white, colored, and Indian. The democratic government instituted various policies and legislative reforms aimed at realigning our institutions in order to transform society and primarily the family institution. 
In my input this morning, I focus on our country's perspective, and you would have heard uh, largely from academics, uh, and I will then bring a different uh, perspective, uh, which is a more real and practical perspective as uh, we talk about some of the um, uh, measures that we've put in place uh, to improve the state of the family, uh, and of course share some best practices on how social policies, in particular family-orientated policies, can um, best support families to respond to growing trends, which include demographic um, uh, trends, including migration and urbanization, and of course, household size, uh, the challenges that families face, and social policy programs that support families, and a few remarks perhaps on the impact of new technologies. In our efforts to create a fair and equal society, South Africa continues to take stock of the social and economic context of the country when developing social policies and programs. South Africa's population increased from approximately 40 million in 96 uh, to 62 million in 2022. That's the recent stat, um, uh, census that we conducted. By 2020, the country's total fertility rate had declined to um, 2.3, as my colleague had indicated. Uh, and it's not just South Africa, but it is indeed a global, um, uh, uh, it's a global there is a global decline in fertility. Um, uh, so we declined to about 2.3 children per woman. Um, which has contributed to a slowing of our country's population rate and consequent um, population age structure changes, in which the median age increased from 22 in 96 to 28 in 2022. Older persons, uh, which are over 60, have seen the largest ra rate of growth over the past 20 years to make up about 9.2% of the country's population by 2022. The number of households increased between 96 and 2022 from approximately 9.1 million in 96 to uh, about 17.8 in 22. And in terms of uh, household size, the average household size decreased from around 4.5 in 96 to around 3.5 in 2022. Official statistics do define four household types, uh, the single uh, person, nuclear, extended, and complex. The largest single category is the extended family household, which is around 36% of all households. And of course, um, followed by the single person households, around 22% and less than one fifth of the households in South Africa take the form of a nuclear family. Demographically though, uh, child dependency is on the decline uh, as the facility rate declines as well and life expectancy rises. Uh, we. Uh, with improved social services, rather, the proportion of children are expected to continue declining, whilst the proportion made up of older persons is expected to increase significantly over time. This demographic transition occurs while South Africa uh, is amongst those with the highest levels of inequality in the world. And that inequality manifests itself uh, through a skewed income distribution, unequal access to opportunities, and regional disparities. Extended periods of low economic growth have also put a strain on our efforts to uh, tackle the historical structural inequalities. And of course, unemployment, poverty, and inequality have remained uh, persistently high. And again, this is probably a global trend. Migration, and some of my colleagues have already spoken to it, uh, as regulated by colonial and apartheid policies uh, until, 20, uh, until 30 years ago at least, uh, coupled with urbanization, has often destabilized and broken up families and disturbed or disrupted the traditional extended family form uh, of Africans. Presently, as a consequence of these disruptions, we still experience challenges such as family disintegration, high rates of child-headed households, especially um, uh, in your rural areas um, in South Africa, high rates of granny-headed households, uh, very popular, uh, and high rates of family-headed households in general. And of course, a lack of constant communication amongst family members. Migration, on the other hand, may bring forth the following benefits, including high payment, uh, paying jobs, a variety of job opportunities, access to better schools and education, better health facilities and better living standards, increased trade opportunities, and reduced poverty through remittances. The family institution in South Africa has gone through some significant changes uh, in its structure and role, uh, and roles over, and roles rather, uh, over the past few years due to uh, the influence of, of the number of trends that I've just mentioned above, and the growing acceptability of alternative forms of domestic partnerships. These have uh, led to challenges that families have encountered, including, but not limited to, 
poverty due to unemployment and landlessness is a very big issue at, uh, in South Africa, and I think one of the colleagues spoke about human settlements, housing, um, health concerns, including HIV and AIDS, and uh, of course the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, um, absentee fathers, a very important matter which we often don't speak about. Um, crime, substance abuse, gender-based violence, uh, teenage pregnancy, amongst others. Um, so, uh, facilitator, let me just dwell on just a few of these very quickly. In terms of poverty and unemployment, um, they continue to place enormous stress upon families as they seek to fulfill uh, their various roles in society. Poverty makes it difficult for families to ensure that the basic needs of its members are met. And there is increased evidence on how poverty and hunger affects mental health of caregivers, placing them under significant strain. The care burden uh, carried predominantly by women uh, has significant effects uh, on women's ability to engage in paid work on a full-time basis. And globally and in South Africa, uh, it is women who bear uh, the brunt of job losses, especially during the, the COVID pandemic, uh, and not only uh, because they're often um, uh, in more vulnerable jobs, but also because um, uh, many had to exit the labor market to take care of their ill families, especially during the COVID pandemic. And of course, the children, because uh, they were at home and during the hard lockdowns. Um, so the care burden certainly is on women. Um, and of course, this also affects um, their economic empowerment. Um, I think we've spoken briefly. I think the health burden of HIV and AIDS, um, again, um, where we see a movement of people from hospitals uh, to um, home-based ca um, home care uh, facilities. I think that's another important factor. And the reality is about 91% or so of HIV and AIDS uh, caregivers in South Africa uh, being women. Um, uh, home-based care has significantly increased the burden of care for many of these women. Access to alternative, um, or rather to health care, uh, is a key tenant also of family well-being. South Africa has free maternal care, high rates of antenatal care coverage, and high rates of delivery of skilled birth attendants. And children under the age of six are entitled to free primary health care. Uh, at public uh, clinics, and this enti uh, ent uh, um, entitlement uh, does not necessarily translate into actual uh, access, by the way, uh, especially in your rural areas. Uh, distances of healthcare facilities and pressured public healthcare systems make um, accessing health services difficult for many, and in 2018, around 20% 20 of children were living in households uh, that were deemed to be far from healthcare facilities. But this has improved quite greatly. Um, of course, in terms of gender-based violence, um, um, it has been a major challenge in South Africa, and sexual violence in, uh, most, uh, is the most common form of gender-based violence and has been consistently high over time. Uh, family violence is a term that encompasses uh, various forms uh, of families, uh, of violence rather, that families uh, may uh, endure, uh, including intimate partner violence as well. Uh, family violence also includes, by the way, child abuse and neglect. Uh, another form of family violence is uh, elderly abuse and neglect and neglect uh, and abuse of other vulnerable family members, of course. Uh, there's very limited statistics, however, on the extent and nature um, of this form of uh, uh, family um, uh, viewing uh, the challenge as only in the form of gender-based violence or only child uh, abuse, uh, abuse missed out on, on ways in which uh, the family as a whole is affected by violence. I think just let me share a compodium of some of the interventions uh, that government has put in place and that are implemented by various ministries um, uh, in South Africa, working, of course, in concert with a number of stakeholders uh, in putting families at the center of development, including but not limited to, uh, firstly, access to shelters, uh, clean water, sanitation, and energy. Uh, this is one of the basic services and basic human rights, rather, in South Africa. Um, and whilst uh, these individuals' rights um, um, uh, they are realized through services to households and by implication to families. Uh, the latest the general household survey and census in 2022 indicated that access to housing, water, sanitation, and electricity has increased significantly over the past 30 years. Um, within most of the local communities, there are also uh, those people who are indigent, and municipalities are responsible to develop and implement their own indigent policies to support such individuals and in free basic services. South Africa has a two-tier care system, uh, namely the public health care and the private health care. And um, the public sector is uh, state-funded uh, and takes and caters to 
um, the majority of our population. The private sector is largely funded through individual contributions to health insurance um, and serves a lesser proportion of the population. Uh, and access to health care, particularly affordable, affordability and availability aspects, have been uh, prioritized by the South African government. And uh, we are now regarded as less um, uh, of a burden uh, to health care. The Integrated Urban Development Framework uh, has introduced, of course, uh, uh, was introduced uh, a few years ago um, to provide a framework for reorganizing the urban system so that cities and towns can become more inclusive, safe, productive, and resource efficient, thus becoming good places to work and live. In terms of food security, and I think one of my colleagues has also spoken to this, government through uh, the Department of Social Development, which I look after, has provided more than 200 community nutrition and development centers to allow poor families to access nutritious foods. And I think what is unique about this is that in those uh, specific areas where these centers are at, uh, we, we are deliberate in utilizing cooperatives in those very uh, same districts or municipalities or uh, or towns who would provide fresh fruit and fresh vegetables uh, to these community nutrition and development centers. And then um, South Africa has introduced a significant social protection system, uh, and that provides non-contributory social um, assistance for children, older persons, persons with disabilities, to approximately 27 million people with a value uh, of around 14 billion rand per annum. And we've now extended this to people between the ages of 18 uh, and 59 who uh, are not working, and we are able to provide some level of assistance uh, in that regard. Okay, so... Um, Establishing access to psychosocial support by deploying social workers in all communities enables families to also connect with these professions, uh, professionals rather, in instances of dysfunction or when seeking information about other government-related services, including assisting uh, with addressing uh, at least at a preventative measure or introducing preventative measures around uh, social ills. We boast a vibrant uh, civil society. Uh, uh, and um, that collaborates with us, of course, in delivering services, including those dedicated to mental health support, which is a very important topic, and uh, comprehensive community-based care and protection services encompasses residential options and respite care as needed. Um, these are also accessible, uh, especially for individuals with disabilities and older persons. Um, the National Climate Change Response uh, policy is a key document that guides our approach towards uh, migration and adaptation to climate change. In terms of disasters, uh, we have a national climate change response white paper, and the country um, promulgated recently, uh, or rather uh, some time ago, uh, the Disaster Management Act, which is what we currently use, and which provides for an integrated and coordinated disaster risk management policy that focuses on preventing or reducing the risk of disasters, mitigating the, sev the sev se severity of disasters, preparedness, uh, rapid and effective response to disasters and, of course, post-disaster recovery, uh, including the establishment of national, provincial, and local disaster centers, uh, including disaster risk management volunteers, I forgot about that, and establishing an intergovernmental committee on uh, disaster management. These social services have provided a much uh, better quality of life for South African households, and thus the found, uh, foundations for improving and, more st uh, uh, and having more stable family life. As I conclude, I must add um, uh, on the matter related to new technologies and um, the extended use of digital platforms, as you would know, and innovative technologies has negative implications, which include, amongst others, uh, unusual screen time fatigue, um, cyberbullying, as some of my colleagues have mentioned, uh, which could have long-term effects on the child well-being, actually. Uh, and on the positive side, though, new technologies may assist in improving parenting education by ensuring that parents have access uh, to advanced information and guidance on everything pertaining to education and how to raise a family. Um, and I think my colleague also spoke to that briefly. Uh, we um, were part of 13 countries uh, that conducted a study together with UNICEF and Interpol on disruptive harm uh, on online child sexual exploitation. And uh, we are currently implementing those recommendations uh, to see them to fruition. So 
what is to be done to address the negative impact of new technologies on families, um, I would make four recommendations. Firstly, we must scale up advocacy uh, programs and campaigns to create awareness about the dangers and negative impact of new technologies. Secondly, we must create regulatory frameworks to regulate the use of technology, especially for children. Thirdly, we must ensure the enforcement of the laws dealing with cybercrime and establishing guidelines for when and where technology should be used. And lastly, uh, we must increase pressure on digital service providers to speed up the removal of child sexual material from digital platforms. And you may have seen um, just a few days ago a number of um, uh, CEOs of uh, very important companies being called to, to Congress to account on a range of issues pertaining to this matter. Um, so I would like to just highlight that um, um, uh, facilitator that uh, South Africa recently adopted the white paper on families, which is aimed at preventing families from disintegration and vulnerability. It seeks, of course, to change the unfavorable conditions affecting um, a family uh, as a unit and moving it from vulnerability to resistance, uh, to resilience rather, uh, and of course to enable it to instill. Uh, societal norms and values, and to protect its members. This white paper is anchored on three pillars in the main, uh, which is promoting family well-being, uh, family relationship strengthening, and of course the treatment and support of vulnerable families. Aligned uh, to this white paper is the strategy on Inspire, uh, which is focused on empowering parents and parenting skills, uh, and is linked to the WHO evidence-based programs as well. Lastly, Chairperson, uh, addressing the impact of mega trends on families necessitates a nuanced approach uh, to understanding the in, uh, inherent challenges and potential benefits that they bring. While these trends may present significant hurdles such as shifts in socioeconomic structures and technological advances, they also provide opportunities for adaptation, resilience, and positive transformation. Societies must therefore establish supportive frameworks that empower families to leverage um, the favorable aspects of megatrends, ensuring inclusive, um, con uh, inclusive inclusivity, rather, connectivity, uh, and overall well-being of every family member. And by acknowledging and addressing the challenges um, uh, while embracing the opportunities, I'm sure that we can work towards cultivating families uh, that are not only uh, that that not only withstand the current. Um, um, uh, challenges or change, uh, but also flourish in the dynamic landscape um, um, uh, shaped by various uh, transformative trends. And I do want to make the point that quite often uh, it is um, the burden of governments to be able to drive and address some of these uh, matters through policy um, uh, uh, development, but it shouldn't only be the burden of governments. It starts in the family and it extends to various sectors of society, including schools, including religious gatherings, including um, uh, uh, through civil society uh, organizations and groupings, particularly community uh, uh, develop, uh, community groups, um, and of course, um, even the role of private sector uh, and other important uh, uh, stakeholders. Um, and I think that that's the point I just wanted to raise. Thank you very much. I thank Mr. Mutuno for his excellent presentation, and I especially appreciate the positive note on which you ended things, uh, reminding us that uh, ch all change is not bad, that change can present challenges, but uh, that humans are an incredibly adaptable species, and we've adapted many times in the past, and we can find ways to live under these new circumstances. I think that's a very positive message that's worth considering and remembering and reminding ourselves, though, that policy changes are necessary in order to make that happen. So I would now like to invite delegations wishing to make comments uh, or to pose questions to please press the microphone button. Please keep your questions short and to the point to allow uh, for as many interactions as possible. Also, please indicate to whom in the panel you are addressing your comment or question. And I take this opportunity to remind delegations that the time limit for interventions is three minutes. So I would now uh, like to give the floor I have two speakers on my list so far. Uh, I would now like to give the floor to His Excellency Yavuz Salim Kiran, the Deputy Minister of Family and Social Services of Turkey. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. As you know, humanity is a large family and the world is our shared home. Creating a fair, sustainable, and human-centered global order is critically essential. We will, uh, as Turkey, uh, 
Uh, we give very much importance on family values and the protection of families. We will announce family empowerment vision document and action plan. We will carry out awareness activities to empower the family against the negative effects of environmental and climate change, digitalization and demographic changes. We are working on policies to encourage fertility to rejuvenate population dynamics. We provide cash assist assistance to families. We are working on policies to reconcile work and family life. We aim to expand daytime care systems like neighborhood kindergartens. We implement policies based on a human-centered, protective, and preventive approach for the family to continue its existence in a strong and healthy way. We regularly measure the impact of our policies on family structure. It is important to develop communication and problem-solving capacities and skills within the family and to increase their resilience before problems arise. We carry out social service activities such as research, training, and consultancy on developing family integrity and marriage. We offer family-oriented education and consultancy services in social service centers. With the, with the Turkey Family Social Support Program, we determine the needs of families and individuals for social service, social assistance, or other public services. We provide them guidance and consultancy to plan and implement social ser service and assistance models according to their needs. Within this program, more than 7 million households have been reached in the last six years. Since 2013, social service centers continue to provide protective, preventive, supportive, and rehabilitative social service activities for families and individuals in cooperation with relevant stakeholders. As our president, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, stated, valuing the family means valuing humanity and the future. In the face of increasing global impositions, I call, I call on all, all our friends to show sensitivity in preserving the family. Thank you. I thank the distinguished representative of Turkey for his statement. And I would now like to give the floor to uh, the distinguished representative from the Islamic Republic of Iran, and that will be followed by uh, representatives from Guyana and Cuba. Okay, thank you. Am I audible? Okay, thank you. Uh, in the name of Allah, the compassionate, the merciful, I would like to express my gratitude uh, for organizing the seventh anniversary of the International Year of Family and for the invaluable speeches of the panelists. At the beginning, I condemned in the in strongest term the crimes and the genocide taking place against the Palestinian families in Gaza. I believe that it's essential to take into serious account the needs, the difficulties, and problems of surviving family members in Gaza who witnessed the sufferings of the war and felt with all their hearts the excruciating pain of losing their family members. The Islamic Republic of Iran, inspired by and following the teachings of Islam, as well as by Iran's constitution and laws, has paid special attention to the issue of the family as the most important social institution. With this perspective, Iran has taken several fundamental measures to strengthen the family and to prevent this instability, among which I refer to the following actions. Passing and implementation the family and the youth protection law in order to ensure the welfare and health of the family. Allocating 1% of the budget of the pu public executive bodies to women and family issues. Pursuing the global initiative for a commitment to the family suggested by Iran's president in the 78th session of the United Nations General Assembly 2023 holding the nationwide event of the family and popular culture with the slogan of from the family and for the family, aiming at reviving the authentic culture of the Iranian family. Implementing the National Plan of Sustainable Family-Oriented Employment to help the family promotion and livelihood. Pursuing the initiative of Women Against Corruption with the aim of raising awareness of the family and society about corruption and alleviating its consequences, including poverty and injustice, using the potential of women in the family. Lastly, in the commemoration of naming the family year, I would like to draw your attention to some serious concerns and questions. The family, as the most important body of society and as, as the basis of the human development and survival on the earth, has always been the result of the married life of a man and a woman. But today, 
Don't you think that the new types of family are deviating the natural, healthy style of life, reproduction, and demography? Don't they damage the human generation in the long run? Isn't this a threat, threat to the health of human body and mind? How are the identity and good interests of the children who grew up in the deviated forms of families influence, who take advantage of promoting the new forms of family? The human community needs opportunities to raise its concerns and discuss these obscurities regarding the family in a fair, non-threatening manner. Thank you. I thank the distinguished representative of the Islamic Republic of Iran for her statement, and I now give the floor to the distinguished representative of Guyana to be followed by representatives from Cuba and the Russian Federation. Thank you very much, Chair. I'd like to say thank you to the participants on the panelists for their presentations today on the International Year of the Family, and to always emphasize how important it is to have global solutions and resources for families as they are considered the foundation and the building blocks of every country. I believe that every country utilizes its resources towards providing for every member of a family. And as such, globally, we should look at ways in which we can advance solutions to situations that emanate from climate change that causes difficulties and also poverty and other areas of concerns that impact on the stability of families. I'd like to say that in our country, we pay attention to every member of the family, including through a non-means tested old age or senior citizens pension that all seniors receive once they attain the age of 65. Our Every Child Safe policy ensures that children are catered for as we also focus on parenting, parenting programs and working with parenting parents in culturally sensitive ways and ways in which they can look at the needs of their children, children who have special needs in addition to children who have special requirements when it comes to education, the empowerment of men, women, and also the safety of women and girls. Our new family violence bill pays attention to the protection of all the members of the family so that they can live in safety and security as well. And we look at also how families can benefit from housing, food security, and also have the important needs catered for through some of our groundbreaking initiatives. As we sit here and we look at families, it is important to also have research done on the merits of the extended family and how the world is changing when it comes to its look at families and what are some of the advantages and benefits we can take away from the extended families that were so prevalent in previous years so that we can have considerations given to families of today in programs to cater for areas that might not be looked at in the way in which families are constructed today. I thank you all very much. I thank the distinguished representative of Guyana for her statement, and I now give the floor to the distinguished representative of Cuba to be followed by the representatives of the Russian Federation and Egypt. Muchas gracias, eh, moderador. Muchas gracias, presidenta. Estimados panelistas, permítanos realizar algunas reflexiones sobre las presentaciones escuchadas las cuales además eh, aprovechamos la oportunidad para agradecer. En primer lugar, nos hubiese gustado que las reflexiones sobre temas como la migración, eh, la urbanización o la fertilidad y su impacto en las familias también hubiese conectado con el impacto que tienen las guerras, las invasiones y la injerencia en los asuntos internos de los estados. Me permito rechazar en los términos más enérgicos el genocidio que tiene lugar contra el pueblo palestino donde hoy se asesinan niños y se destruyen familias para siempre. Ahí debe estar hoy nuestra mirada y nuestra acción más aguda. Con relación a la presentación de la Secretaría General Adjunta, valoramos positivamente el informe que se ha presentado y los esfuerzos que se realizan para celebrar el 30 aniversario del Año Internacional de la Familia. Apreciamos que el informe ofrece recomendaciones valiosas, 
pero nos parece que no pueden ser recomendaciones homogéneas, sino que deben tener en cuenta las realidades, tradiciones y culturas de cada país, a la vez que deben ser implementadas desde una mirada de desarrollo social. Nos hubiese gustado también que el informe se refiriera a la determinación expresada en la Agenda 2030, relativa a ayudar a los países en desarrollo a lograr la sostenibilidad de la deuda a largo plazo, con políticas orientadas a fomentar la financiación, el alivio y la reestructuración de la deuda. Como es conocido, la, car la carga de la deuda exacerba los numerosos problemas a que se enfrentan los países en desarrollo y representa un obstáculo primordial para su desarrollo social. En el caso de Cuba, hemos sufrido por más de 60 años la imposición de bloqueo de los Estados Unidos, el cual constituye el principal freno al desarrollo económico y social de mi país. Mientras se hace cada vez más usual la imposición de medidas coercitivas unilaterales a países en desarrollo con un impacto directo en las familias. Nos gustaría escuchar comentarios sobre este tema de los panelistas. Con relación a la presentación realizada sobre urbanización, queríamos solo señalar que tenemos en Cuba un plan de Estado sobre el enfrentamiento al cambio climático con compromisos internacionales que contienen importantes acciones de adaptación y mitigación. Durante la presidencia de Cuba eh, del G77 abordamos estas cuestiones y se avanzaron en proyectos de cooperación en este sentido. Un, pa un poco para concluir, quería señalar que eh, celebramos este año el Día Internacional de las Familias con la adopción desde hace más de un año del nuevo Código de las Familias en Cuba, siendo un código robusto, moderno y de los más avanzados de su tipo en el mundo. Muchas gracias. I thank the distinguished representative of Cuba for her statement, and I now give the floor to the distinguished representative of the Russian Federation to be followed by the representatives of Egypt and Malaysia. Благодарю вас, господин председатель. Прежде всего хотелось бы выразить признательность докладчикам за их ценный вклад в нашу дискуссию о том, как современные мировые тенденции, такие как развитие информационных технологий, миграция урбанизация, климатические изменения влияют на роль семейных ценностей в мире. Представляется логичным, что сегодня, когда мы празднуем уже третий юбилей проведения Международного года семьи, слова о необходимости укрепления этого института вновь звучат на площадке Комиссии социального развития. В России в целых популяризации государственной политики в рассматриваемой сфере указом президента Российской Федерации 2024 год также объявлен годом семьи, ведь именно обеспечению благополучия и прочности семей Российская Федерация уделяет первостепенное значение. С 2014 года действует концепция государственной семейной политики на период 2000, до, до 2025 года. Она направлена, среди прочего, на повышение авторитета родительства в семье и обществе, профилактику и преодоление семейного неблагополучия, улучшение условий и повышение качества жизни семей. Поддержка Института семьи входит в число социальных приоритетов ООН. Эта задача неразрывно связана с достижением гендерного равенства и расширения прав и возможностей женщин, а также с усилиями мирового сообщества по поощрению и защите прав детей. Ежегодно Генеральная Ассамблея ООН консенсусом принимает посвященные семейным вопросам резолюции, последний из которых – подготовка и проведение 30-летнего юбилея Международного года семьи – была принята в декабре 2023 года. Российская Федерация каждый раз входит в число соавторов этих документов. В этой связи хотелось бы задать всем участникам дискуссии следующий вопрос. Как вы считаете, возможно ли достижение цели устойчивого развития, определенных в повестке 2030, и, в частности, социальное развитие, без учета важной роли семьи в этом процессе? И как, по-вашему, государство-члены ООН и сама организация могли бы поспособствовать укреплению деятельности по формированию семейной политики в рамках предпринимаемых ими усилиями, по достижению согласованных на международном уровне целей в области развития. Благодарю вас. I thank the distinguished representative of the Russian Federation, and I now give the floor to the distinguished representative of Egypt to be followed by the representatives of Malaysia 
and the European Union. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, Mr. Moderator, as we celebrate the 10th anniversary of the uh, establishment of the International Year of the Family, it is quite opportune to, to have such um, an enriching discussion on the family and the challenges it faces in our modern world from a different perspective or from a different lens. And I have to acknowledge that this really happened with, with the panels today, with, um, uh, with the input that we have received and the fresh look that we had on how we address those challenges, especially when it relates to emerging issues and new issues and how they impact the family from the social perspective, from the economic perspective, um, and uh, all those issues are actually intertwined. So, as identified in Copenhagen Declaration of 1995, the family is indeed the basic unit of society and it plays a, a key role in social development. And likewise, and long before even Copenhagen, long before the World Summit for Social Development, the Universal Declaration on Human Rights has also identified or recognized the family as the natural and fundamental group unit of society. And it is accordingly entitled to protection by society and the state. So these are two levels of protection and action that has to be taken to address the family um, in each of our uh, nations. Uh, and to be contextualized according to the cultural backgrounds, the religious backgrounds, in, in, in order to be able to have policies that respond to the specific needs of families and the social structure that exists, especially that the family is where we provide also the care and support for children, for the elderly, and to recognize this intergenerational continuum when it relates to how the family uh, is better functioning for the best interests of all its members, as well as for the best interest of the community and uh, the nation at large. And it is quite evident that families and societies and whole nations face multiple challenges, and this requires further national and international action. Um, and in this connection, I would like again to thank um, the enriching input that has been put forward by the panelists. Uh, at the national level, and because we realize that it is a social and an economic aspect in Egypt, we believe that the family having this central role and being the cornerstone of, of uh, society and a cornerstone for social development and uh, the safe environment for children and youth and support for older persons as well. We are imp implementing actually a family development plan and this plan is premised on digitalization of data collection on demographics. It addresses the population aspect of it. Uh, it monitors the impact of implemented policies, the cultural background and the cultural context within this happens. It raises awareness and uh, addresses education, service provision, uh, economic empowerment, particularly of women, and it targets children, youth, women, and rural communities. And this comes into a bigger context when we have another project on decent life, which addresses uh, generally um, people and families in um, remote areas, in rural areas who don't generally have access to uh, safe drinking water and sanitation, for example, uh, proper access uh, to education, health care services, and the provision of all this is uh, premised on the idea of also of having adequate housing. So all this builds up uh, in an interconnected manner. However, challenges do exist in implementation, in design implementation, the, um, in, um, the interagency coordination, the participation of civil society and other partners, and the funding, of course, which is also a crucial aspect of it. And I would like if we can gain more input from the panelists on those ideas that I've just uh, raised. Thank you. I thank the distinguished representative of Egypt for her statement, and I now give the floor to the distinguished representative of Malaysia to be followed by the representatives of the European Union and Kenya. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Malaysia believes that strong family institution is key to social and nation's development. Nevertheless, Malaysia, like other countries, face various challenges in its endeavors to strengthen family institutions. As an example, while the progress of women participating in the workforce has been noteworthy, challenging traditional gender roles, however, recent trends show that there are many young people chose to delay marriage for career stability, which contributes to low fertility rate. In a span of five years, Malaysia is expected to have a slight decline of total fertility rate TFR from 1.8 in 2019 to 1 1.7 in 2030, far behind the global TFR at 2.3. In addition, the use of internet among children aged 5 to 17 has surged, 
Conversely, the awareness among parents about parental control, which has reduced to 53.4% compared to 62.4% in 2018. Although digital technology advancement is indispensable as it improves education method, accelerate communication and life productivity, borderless internet usage among children exposes them to the potential risk of cyberbullying, grooming, sexual abuse and exploitation, which have adverse effects on their physical and mental health. Recognizing these challenges and the importance of enhancing the resilience of family institutions, the government has formulated national family policy that acts as a catalyst to urge relevant stakeholders to emphasize family perspectives in all policies, initiatives, as well as programs for the family well-being. In response to the mega trends and its impact on the family, the government is in the midst of further reviewing relevant policies to meet the current needs as well as to address family-related issues. In an effort to strengthen family institution, the government has implemented various initiatives including family education programs and family-friendly policies at workplace. Education programs for parents serve as guidance on parenting skills, ensuring stable and resilient family units as well as equip families to face modern-day challenges and work-life balance issues. In addition, the government also encourages government agencies to set up more childcare centres at workplaces to support working parents, providing them opportunities to advance their careers while ensuring family stability. Mr. Moderator, Malaysia appreciates the panellists for sharing their insights on this very important topic today. We take note of the many actionable solutions that have been discussed and stand ready to collaborate with other states in this regard. Thank you. I thank the distinguished representative of Malaysia for her statement, and I now give the floor to the distinguished representative of the European Union to be followed by representatives of Kenya and Iraq. Thank you, Mr. Moder Moderator. Uh, the Charter uh, of uh, Fundamental Rights, the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union states that everyone has the right to respect for his or her private uh, and family life. The right to marry and the right to found a family is guaranteed in accordance with national laws governing the exercise of these rights. Acknowledging that uh, the fact that various forms of the family exist, uh, better support for families, enhancing the well-being of children and allowing the reconciliation of work, family and private life for women and men with caring responsibilities is crucial to a better quality of life and to the economic development. Uh, the EU and its member states attach importance to promoting better work-life balance for women and men throughout the life course as to enhance gender equality, including uh, to ensure that both women and men can equally participate and enhance in the labor market, as well as uh, contribute to meeting the demographic challenges. Both women and men could benefit from family-friendly employment policies and from equal sharing of unpaid work and of responsibilities in the household. In this regard, uh, due attention should be paid to tackling and combating gender biases and other stereotypes. We are committed to uh, promote cohesion and employment opportunities for workers, uh, including through promoting men's uh, role in the family, uh, equality between women and men, and reconciliation of work and family life, for instance, by promoting flexible working arrangements and various forms of leave for both women and men, by improving the supply of adequate, affordable, high-quality child care services for children under the mandatory school age, by improving the provision of care facilities for other dependents, by providing training and qualifications of care workers and by encouraging employers to offer their employees childcare and other appropriate family support services, including family-friendly labor market initiatives. I have a question uh, to uh, the panelists. Uh, what kind of measures would you recommend uh, to facilitate the reconciliation of work, family and private life, and to promote better work-life balance for women and men throughout the life course? Thank you. I thank the distinguished representative of the European Union for her statement, and I now give the floor to the distinguished representative of Kenya to be followed by the representatives of Iraq and Qatar. Thank you, 
Our distinguished delegates, the Constitution of Kenya recognizes the family as a natural and fundamental unit of society and the necessary basis of social order and should therefore enjoy the recognition and protection of the state. The current family is experiencing numerous challenges coupled with impacts of migration, urbanization, technology, climate change, among others. In affirmation of the solemn duty of the state to protect the family, the government has enacted the national policy on family promotion and protection. This policy provides a coherent and comprehensive framework for the implementation and monitoring of interventions for, for protection of families. The government of Kenya is implementing a national positive parenting program. This initiative is aimed at building the capacities of parents and caregivers to nurture healthy family bonds, child development, and proactively mitigate the risk of family separation. To fully align with globally accepted standards of care, the government, in collaboration with other like-minded players in the ch children's sector, adopted a unified and holistic approach towards reforming the child care system by developing the National Care Reform Strategy for Children in Kenya. Through the strategy, children with disabilities shall be prioritized in the interventions that support their care within families, either biological families or alternative care families, such as foster care, guardianship, guardianship, guardianship and kafala. Kenya has instituted community structures to support families access various social services. This include community health promoters, lay volunteer counselors, and the child protection volunteers. A question for the panelists. How can we create safe and equitable access to digital environment while ensuring families enjoy the benefits of digital transformation? Thank you. I thank the distinguished representative of Kenya for her statement. And I now give the floor to the distinguished representative of Iraq to be followed by the representatives of Qatar and India. Thank you, moderator. بمناسبة احتفال لجنة التنمية الاجتماعية بالذكرى السنوية الثلاثين للسنة الدولية للأسرة، أود أن أبين الأهمية التي توليها حكومة بلادي لهذه المؤسسة الصغيرة، التي تعتبر نواة المجتمع وأهمية الحفاظ على كيانها وحمايتها ومراعاة وحدتها وفق القيم المجتمعية للدول والمواثيق الدولية التي راعت الحفاظ عليها. وبما يتوافق مع ما جاء في المادة 23 من العهد الدولي للحقوق المدنية والسياسية باعتبارها الوحدة الجماعية الطبيعية والأساسية في المجتمع فتماسك الأسرة وقوتها يؤدي إلى بناء المجتمع وانسجاما مع الأديان السماوية وتقاليد المجتمعات التي تحترم دور الأسرة كونها أقدم وأهم مؤسسة وصلت إلينا بشكلها الأصلي تتحقق بالزواج بمفهومه الصحيح في الإسلام وكذلك في جميع الأديان وهو عقد اجتماعي وديني بين رجل وامرأة شرع من أجل التناسل وتنمية المجتمع ويدعو العراق إلى عدم تفكيك الأسرة وتفريغ دورها بزرع مفاهيم جديدة في تعريفها وإدراج محتوى يروج للقيم الخلافية ومزدوجي الميل الجنسي ومغايري الهوية والتربية الجنسية الشاملة وإيمانا من العراق بأهمية الأسرة فإنه نظم مؤخر انضم مؤخرا إلى مجموعة أصدقاء الأسرة ويتعهد بتقديم وتيسير كل ما من شأنه أن يدعم هذه المجموعة وبما يفضي إلى تحقيق أهدافها النبيلة في الحفاظ على كيان الأسرة إن حكومة بلادي مستمرة بالعمل رغم جميع التحديات بتقديم كل ما من شأنه تحسين الواقع الاجتماعي للأسرة العراقية بمختلف أفرادها من خلال تعزيز التوافق الاجتماعي وفي الوقت نفسه تدعو المجتمع الدولي إلى دعمها ومساندتها من أجل تحقيق ما تسعى له للوصول بالأسرة أعلى مستويات التنمية ومواجهة التحديات التي تحول دون تحقيق ذلك وفي هذا الإطار 
نعرب عن شكرنا للجهود المبذولة من قبل المؤسسات والمنظمات الدولية وخصوصا منظمة الأمم المتحدة لما تقدمه من دعم للعراق في مجال حقوق الإنسان ونتطلع إلى المزيد من التعاون وشكرا I thank the distinguished representative of Iraq for her statement and I now give the floor to the distinguished representative of Qatar to be followed by the representatives of India and of the International Federation for Family Development السيد الرئيس على قاعة الكلمة يسعدني أن أخاطبكم في هذه الجلسة الهامة والتي تسلط الضوء على موضوع الذكرى السنوية الثلاثون للسنة الدولية للأسرة وذلك لدعم وتمكين نظام الأسرة على مستوى العالم من خلال تطوير السياسات والبرامج التي تعزز دور الأسرة فقد ظل موضوع الأسرة ضمن أهم أعمدة استراتيجيات دولة غطر للتنمية الاجتماعية ورؤيتها الوطنية 2030 وتأتي استضافة دولة غطر للمؤتمر الدولي للأسرة في الدوحة في شهر أكتوبر القادم بمناسبة الذكرى الثلاثون للسنة الدولية للأسرة تأكيدا لهذا الاهتمام الكبير الذي توليه دولة غطر لدور الأسرة في المجتمع سيد الرئيس لقد سعد دولة غطر منذ وقت مبكر لبناء عمل مؤسسي وبحثي مستقل قائم على نتائج علمية في إبراز غضايا الأسرة بإجراء دراسات وبحوث شاملة على المستوى الدولي والإقليمي والتي اطلع بها معهد الدوحة الدولي للأسرة الذي عمل منذ تأسيسه في عام 2006 على يد صاحبة السمو الشيخة موزة بنت ناصر على تعزيز المعرفة حول الأسرة العربية وذلك من خلال تقديم البحوث والدراسات والدعوة لقضاء الأسرة من خلال تعزيز ودعم السياسات الأسرية المبنية على الأدلة على المستوى الوطني والإقليمي وكذلك الدولي ويأتي تنظيم هذا المؤتمر تأكيدا للتعاون المثمر بين دولة قطر والأمم المتحدة إلى جانب شركاء دوليين وأقليميين ووطنيين في هذه المواضيع المهمة وقد عبرت سعادة السفيرة الشيخة عليا بنت أحمد بن سيف الثاني المندوب الدائم لدولة قطر لدى الأمم المتحدة بوصف هذا المؤتمر أنه يسلط الضوء على الأهمية الحيوية التي توليها دولة قطر إلى الأسرة وفي الختام فأن دولة قطر تتطلع لاستضافة هذا المؤتمر الدولي الهام واستضافة شركائها في الأمم المتحدة والمنظمات الدولية والدول ومؤسسات المجتمع المدني وكافة المعنيين ونأمل في أن يخرج المؤتمر بمقترحات وخطط طموحة تعزز من دور الأسرة في تحقيق التنمية الاجتماعية والعدالة الاجتماعية وتعزيز قدرة الأسر على الصمود في عالم التكنولوجيات الرقمية الناشئة والتحديات التنموية الكبرى لتنعم الإنسانية بالحياة الكريمة في مجتمع أكثر شمولا وأنصافا وشكرا على إتاحة الفرصة I thank the distinguished representative of Qatar for his statement, and I now give the floor to the distinguished representative of India to be followed by the representatives of Israel and then the International Federation for Family Development. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. India believes in Vasudev Kutumbakam, that is one word, one family. The families are fundamental to the social fabric of our country. India has foregrounded the family in various interventions to ensure family as a safe space for all members. Within the family also, women are increasingly recognized as change makers and decision makers. Acknowledging the disproportionate impact of corruption networks in hindering citizens' access to public services, the government of India has started disbursing of disbursement of benefits under various welfare schemes directly to the families in a transparent manner through the direct benefit transfer mode. DBT eliminates human interface in transactions, thereby cutting the scope for illegal gratification. Notably, India has introduced One Nation, One Ration Card that enables people from vulnerable sections, including migrant workers, to avail free fruit gains anywhere in the country. Further, India provides direct tra cash transfers to over 112 million farmers through digital mode. 
India is committed to bridging digital divide and India is already leading the way in digital financial transactions. Unified Payments Interface, UPI, developed in India has transformed the way financial transactions are made, completely digitalizing the field with 117 billion transactions in 2023, up by 147% in terms of volume in one year. You can pay rupee one through UPI to a local state vendor or anyone with a mobile phone. This is absolutely free of charge. To support the family and enable women to rest and recover after childbirth, uh, the paid maternity leave has been increased from 12 to 26 weeks. India has also provided financial support to 33 million expectant mothers with a total disbursement of more than USD 1.7 billion, thus ensuring income security as well as women's health. At the same time, we recognize and provide support to persons who don't have families. India has robust laws and policy intervention focused on dignified living for widows, senior citizens, and children in need of care and protection. Acknowledging pejorative gen gendered social bias, India has targeted to prevent and eliminate female fertilicide through a multi-pronged approach of stringent implementation of legal frameworks, behavior change in societies which celebrate the girl child, and financial support and incentives for the girl child. Uh, gross enrollment ratio for girls is almost at par with the boys and uh, in higher institutions. 43% of students enroll for STEM disciplines, science, technology, engineering, maths in higher education in India are women. The figure even exceeds what we see in many of the development econ developed economies. Interestingly, we see our society transforming where men respect women's opinion as partners in the household. More women participate in major household decisions today. The latest data shows 88.7% women participate in major household decisions today as against 84% five years ago. The incidence of spousal violence has also reduced considerably in the past decade. India is committed to observing the three decennial anniversary of the International Year of Family, implementing its objectives towards promoting and enabling society for diverse families to thrive. Thank you, Chair. I thank the distinguished representative of India for his statement, and I now give the floor to the distinguished representative of Israel to be followed by the representatives of the International Federation for Family Development and the Doha International Family Institute. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. With regard to the statement of the representative of the Iranian Ayatollah regime, whose regime funds terrorists who deliberately butcher whole families, including women on, and children, how is this promoting the family? When Iranian-funded murderers build tunnels and store arms under schools using children as human shields, how is this supporting the family? The statement of the Iranian representative is not only a gross misrepresentation, it is hypocrisy at its most reprehensible. Mr. Moderator, uh, with regards to our policies on family-related issues, Israel has a comprehensive social welfare system overseen by the Ministry of Welfare and Social Affairs. The government provides support programs for people at every stage of life, including single parents, children and youth, as well as care for the elderly. The system also responds to the needs of vulnerable people through programs to prevent and treat substance abuse, managing probation and providing employment and employment counseling for the physically disabled. Persons with dis disabilities are cared for through residential and community-based programs. These programs are often administered at the local level. In fact, since 1958, local governments have been required by law to maintain a department responsible for social services. Excellencies, we agreed decades ago on the need to foster social development, but our goals globally have not yet been met. Israel will continue to strengthen its own social development while helping to build the capacity of others to achieve this themselves. Thank you. I thank the distinguished representative of Israel for his statement. I now give the floor to the distinguished representative of the International Federation for Family Development to be followed by the representatives of the Doha International Family Institute and the Blue Tree Foundation. I am Miguel Garcia Nates, student of the University at Madrid, Spain. I represent the youth of the International Federation for Family Development. In recent months, eight student groups from various European universities across six countries 
investigated the impact of climate anxiety on family planning, supports of their contribution to the 30th anniversary preparations for the International Year of the Family. We concluded that addressing declining birth rates requires a nuanced understanding of various factors, including climate change anxiety and shifts towards individualism in society. There is no one size fits all solution and potential secondary effects of simplistic approaches must be considered. I would like to ask Professor Trask how we can overcome the fear and negative views about the future and be able to start a family as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights mentions in Article 16. Thank you. I thank the distinguished representative of the International Federation for Family Development. And I now give the floor to the representative of the Doha International Family Institute to be followed by the representatives of the Blue Tree Foundation and the SOS Children's Villages. Uh, thank you very much. I would like to thank the panelists for the very informative panel. Following up on the inter intervention by the distinguished representative of the state of Qatar, my intervention is just to bring to all attendees attention that the Doha International Family Institute will be organized, organizing the international uh, conference, Family and uh, Contemporary Megatrends, in commemoration of the 30th anniversary of the International Year of the Family. The conference will be held in Doha from October 29th to 31st, 2024, hosted by Qatar, organized by DV in support of UNDESA and in partnership with many national, regional, and international parent, partners. The conference will, will provide a platform for evidence-based policy dialogue, collective action, and innovative uh, solution for, uh, to address the challenges uh, posed by megatrends. Beyond the insightful plenary session and dynamic uh, policy dialogues with uh, leaders, experts, and participants, the Doha conference goes uh, st a step uh, further. We understand that family are the heart of this uh, conversation, and that's why we are creating a unique family engaging space where participants can bring their children and family members to engage in a vibrant area tolerated to different age groups. We welcome you to join us in our conference. Thank you. I thank the distinguished representative of the Doha International Family Institute for her statement. I now give the floor to the distinguished representative of the Blue Tree Foundation to be followed by the SOS Children's Villages. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. My name is Hina Myung, a chief researcher at the Blue Tree Foundation, an NGO based in Republic of Korea to prevent and eradicate school and cyberbullying. Although we'll be farther elaborating on the role of youth within the digital transformation era at our side event tomorrow, I would like to place one question on the table in regards to family and new digital technology. As Ms. Walker, the panelist, has mentioned today, both the values and concerns of ICT exists for youth and families, calling for equitable access to education. In this regard, what methods, what methods are suggested for the international community to most effectively reach the youth that do not or have less access to digital devices, as well as the parents that are not familiar with the virtual learning. Thank you. I thank the distinguished representative of the Blue Tree Foundation for her statement. I now give the floor to the distinguished representative of the SOS Children's Villages. and distinguished panelists. Let me present. My name is Sonia Brook. 
I am the vice chair of the executive board of SOS Children's Village Brazil. SOS Children's Village works in more than 135 countries to prevent child family separation and address one of the worst consequences of failed family policies, the loss of care by the child. In our programmatic work, we see every day the impacts of digital technologies, migration policies that don't respect the rights of the child, lack of support to intergenerational relations, and climate change in, ch in children around the world. My question to the panel is, do you think that policymakers and family experts listen to different family members and especially children, enough, enough when they decide in the direction of these policies? We think only by listening to the people affected, we can do effective policies and programs. How can we better include the perspective of children and organizations representing their interests in the work to draft, negotiate, and implement family strengthening policies? Thank you. I thank the distinguished representative of the SOS Children's Villages, and I now give the floor to the distinguished representative of Iran, is the Islamic Republic of Iran, for a second statement. Madam Chair, thank you very much for giving the floor again. My delegation have been taking the floor to reply to allegations made by the representative of the Israeli regime against the Islamic Republic of Iran today. This regime should reconsider bringing such a history to the public's attention. This is due to the fact that its shameful history of more than 75 years can be summed up in a few words. Occupation, brutality, massacre, and fragrant violations of human rights and humanitarian law. Madam Chair, needless to say, considering the discussions today and also considering valiantly false allegations made by Israeli authorities, particularly during the recent massacre in Gaza, nobody has any reason to believe them any longer. While categorically rejecting all these allegations, my delegation would like to reiterate that the Israeli regime has a long history of pursuing opportunistic policies in order to mislead others and divert attention from their inhumane and brutal actions against innocent Palestinians and other nations in the Middle East. In the face of international legitimacy, Israel, the last apartheid regime, and the only regime in the world that practices open racism and has legalized it, attempts to ride the wave of international legitimacy. A dreadfully regressive regime pretends to be progressive by utilizing advanced technologies provided by certain powers. Such a long, dark catalog of crimes and atrocities, such as state terrorism and crime against humanity, poses a uniquely grave threat to regional as well as international peace and security. I thank you. I thank the distinguished representative of the Islamic Republic of Iran, and I now give the floor to the distinguished representative of Israel for a second statement. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, and I'm sorry I have to do it again. Um, we condemn in the strongest terms the false comments made by a representative of the Ayatollah regime. The full story of the war against Hamas will not be complete without mentioning the oppressive current Iranian regime. This regime is at the very heart of the problem. It finances, arms, and trains Hamas, and is therefore responsible for its capabilities and for its actions. It operates in an identical manner from the north by Hezbollah, and the South through the Houthis. These actions perpetrated by the Ayatollah regime aimed to destabilize our region and threaten the peace of the entire world. The international community must make it clear to this murderous regime that Israel will not accept the current security reality. Thank you. That concludes our statements from the floor. And I would now like to give the floor uh, back to the panelists to make uh, comments and to answer questions that have been posed to them. 
So shall we start, shall we go in the same order of the original speakers? So first, uh, Ms. Um, Trask, please go ahead. Thank you very much. It is very heartening to hear how many countries are doing, are trying to do and doing some very uh, supportive things for families. I was sitting here thinking that in the end, the only way that these SDGs are going to be realized is by centering family policy and family programs in a comprehensive manner that includes housing, transportation, economic opportunities, educational opportunities, and addressing the problems that are being caused by climate change. And this requires not that we only focus on young children or on teenagers or on couples, but really on the whole life course and only through this family lens. Um, to the representative from the IFFD who talked about young people who are fearful of starting a family, I want to say that you know, I'm a cultural anthropologist and human beings have lived for a very long time on this earth under very many different types of conditions, everything from plagues to floods to famines, you know, and we have found ways to survive. So I think it is through a forum like this and other educational forms that we can come up with potential solutions. Several people mentioned regionality. Yes, I think that this is incredibly important. I said from the beginning, we don't have solutions that everybody can apply. We can address the problems, but they need to be applied in specific context. Work family was mentioned also. Work family uh, conflict negotiation is a global problem in low income, high income countries, and also across the socioeconomic sphere in all countries. And this requires uh, solutions from businesses, but also solutions from government. And the solutions are many, which is flexible work, for some people remote work, early care, but also uh, after school programs for children and for adolescents, and then also, of course, educational and, um, educational and occupational opportunities for young people as well as elder care. So again, I will just conclude by saying it's these comprehensive family-based programs and policies that will help move the agenda forward. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Trask. And I now give the floor to Ms. Mokomane for any okay. responses. Thank you very much for all the um, interventions and the questions. Uh, I'll, I just noted three that I think I'll uh, comment on. One was on the to make sure that recommendations that we make do not interfere with domestic issues or, 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 or context. And I really do, or realities, and I really do agree. And I think probably just implicit in the recommendations that we make that everything should be context specific and culturally sensitive. It's very important because if it's not, and I think it's, it's just not going to, going to fly. So I think that's, a, that's very important. And uh, we read it as that, all the recommendations, because some things might work in one context but not work in another. And the, um, an example of work family balance solutions is, a, is, is an example. I come from Africa where majority over 75% of people are in the informal sector. So it doesn't matter how generous you have a parental leave policy that gives you five years, it's just not going to benefit majority of, of, of workers. So we have to look at those contexts, even though we understand that even uh, informal sector workers also face work family challenges, but the context is different and what is culturally important. You talked about um, Fertility is high fertility necessarily a, a, a major problem, and I think the representative of IFFD said that it's also culturally uh, important to have a cultural sensitive because in context where you don't have any all, um, care for senior citizens, the family is the only form of informal social protection there. There was a question about is it possible to achieve SDGs without family policies? I 
struggle to see how that can be done because the SDGs in the first place are meant to for human development. Then we said that family is the founding, the cornerstone of, of society and human development. So it's very um, important that we mainstream family policies into all these SDGs. We actually had a project a few years ago on SDGs and the family, and it's a major resource to see how this can be, can be done. And I think whatever policy, whatever SDG intervention or uh, efforts we do, we have to put in a family impact lens to see how that can be done. I've talked about um, work family, uh, balance in formal sector is a very important, especially in the African setting. And also sometimes some of the solutions that we um, I, uh, we put forward for work family balance. Also, I kind of say often assume that family members who are who are needing care, small children without any disabilities. And so look at people, different types of family members, people with disabilities, older people. It's easy for me, I can look after your cute three-month-old baby, <laughs> but I don't think you can look after my 80-year-old sick father. So what, what solutions can, can, help, can, can, can we put in place there? And I think, um, yeah, that's my contribution. Thank you. I thank Ms. Mokomame for her um, statement just now, and I give the floor to Ms. Walker to respond to any questions. Thank you. Uh, there were several direct questions related to uh, digital access and digital safety, um, I believe from uh, the representative from Kenya. Um, and also, I want to respond to the um, uh, representative from Blue Tree in Korea. And then finally, just a very quick note uh, related to work-family balance. Um, with relationship to access to uh, digital uh, devices and access to the internet as well as to um, things being coordinated, I would really reinforce a very coordinated approach. Um, you know, I think what families are finding is a very piecemeal where they might go to healthcare and it's very high tech and there are a lot of professionals that are very comfortable with providing, say, virtual health care. And then they'll, they see their children struggling in school with teachers who are really um, under-resourced. And so I, I would really recommend that at any um, national, international level, that, um, that different agencies talk to each other. Um, any of those who represent families to really understand the value of technology in families' lives and how they can help families have greater access. I think we put a lot of pressure into innovation and into industry and how um, what technology means to help countries be more economically sustainable. Um, but our conversation needs to go beyond that. Um, and to be inclusive of, inclusive of family life. The conversations about technology access cannot be within the family, quote unquote, family agencies. Um, they can't be within just UNICEF and focus on children. Um, the family needs to be considered in very comprehensive, coordinated strategies because, again, families are the, the cornerstone. There are very practical efforts in terms of um, getting uh, access out in terms of more high-speed 5G lines, but not into more rural areas to make um, access to the internet as well as to cell towers um, more available. But they also need to be reliable um, and so, um, and we also need to look at speed. So as we're extending them out, um, we need to look at the device, um, then the devices locally and the quality that are again provided to the different resources that families use, especially um, in schools and healthcare, all the services that, that families use. Um, there are efforts that can support the purchase of various technologies. Um, and we can't be satisfied that a single, we can count a family household saying, oh, well, they have uh, a phone or they have a computer. 
Well, we know in this day and age, children and adults are on technologies all the time, and so to extend those reaches. Um, there are programs that will loan, um, loan devices, that will loan Wi-Fi hubs that can make them more available. And finally, I think we need to provide more resources um, for training. So um, then, very specifically related to safety and digital literacy, I believe it's everybody's issue. Um, but I would start with the big tech companies. Um, as, as it was mentioned, you know, they were just um, testifying. Uh, Google, Meta, um, Apple, um, they were all testifying to a Senate hearing, I believe it was last week. Yeah. And we're not holding them accountable. And I'm not going to get on a soapbox about that, but they can do more. Um, I believe that they're putting a lot of money into innovation and, um, and ways to get more eyeballs on their screens, and they can do just as much effort to make, uh, make the, the screens that children are looking at uh, safer. Yeah. So definitely we need to look, and also those companies have a lion's share um, across the world. So this is not just a Silicon Valley, United States issue. Um, Google, Meta, um, and Apple, at the very least, have a global share of the internet. Um, and then um, I would also say there are, you know, to really support efforts such as UNICEF uh, that are leading the, the way in providing more ethical frameworks that then can be um, adopted worldwide, and places like the International Federation of Family Development that are working country by country to really take a look at issues that affect children and families with digital equality and digital safety being one of them. And certainly digital safety also is within the family and any of the educational efforts you know, that we can do to support parents um, will help parents not only monitor what their children are doing, but also open those conversations when children feel scared, when they feel, when they're feeling bullied, because parents not only are communicating and, and you know, providing a safe haven for children, but they're also their advocates. And they can go to the schools and also work with the schools to provide those environments um, for children. Um, just with related to, um, I, I very much appreciate the question on disenfranchisement. Could you please wrap I, up quickly, though? Yeah, We're I running will. Running out of time. Thank you, you know, I think that it's a matter of time. I think that the more that we have a global understanding um, and we do more research and we have more um, um, action, it'll trickle down uh, to, uh, to have a wider reach and more agencies that work with, with families will, um, will, uh, will um, um, reach them. But also to that we can't just think of schools or we can't think of workplaces as those traditional environments, but we have to think of all the environments that children interact with, religious agencies, um, you know, the organization, sports, things like that. That's another way to, to reach children. Um, and then finally, just very quickly about work-family balance, I would pay attention to what technology is doing to change what work looks like. And so there are a whole lot of jobs that are being replaced by artificial intelligence. And as innovation um, continues, we need to take a close look at how families are going to be unemployed because their jobs are no longer needed and more efforts related to retraining. Um, and also then where, you know, the context that families are working and how technology is being used. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Walker, for this statement, for these responses. And I now give the floor to Mr. Machuno. Thank you. Thank you very much, moderator. And I must appreciate the comments and questions raised by the colleagues on the ground um, or on the floor. Um, because I speak as a member state, a few things that I will say, which are um, our position on, on some of these matters. So I think, obviously, understanding and appreciating that the world has changed over the number of, of decades. Um, as governments, we obviously, and development activists, we have to remain relevant uh, and adapt to these changes uh, due to these mega trends that have caused these changes. And I think, um, in most instances, we don't have control over these mega, uh, these mega um, uh, trends. So we must adapt, and I think that that's important. It's in the case of South Africa, um, our constitution actually protects people uh, in various types of families as they wish to, um, uh, to form. And I think our experience also in, um, is that protection of human rights of individuals best serves um, uh, uh, to strengthen families in the main. 
uh, and many of the services that are given to individuals uh, eventually trickle down uh, to the household um, and everybody in terms of the whole family eventually gets the support. I just want to say to uh, the representative of Iran, uh, as indicated in my presentation, um, uh, we recognize uh, the role that families play as the basic and natural unit, of course, of society. Uh, and within our context, we recognize that we have various forms of families, and this may include child-headed households, uh, single uh, parent, um, uh, grandparent headed households, etc. Uh, and of course, uh, we develop uh, when we develop the programs uh, which support families. It's built on the South African common values of Ubuntu, uh, which is humanity um, to others. Um, and so ours is to uh, you know build social inclusion and social cohesion in the main. Uh, I just want to say to the representative of Cuba uh, that, uh, of course, we uh, share a long history of brotherly relations, uh, and uh, we continue to use platforms, um, international platforms, uh, to highlight uh, the impact of sanctions uh, uh, on greater society. And, of course, we use this platform also to advocate uh, for alternative responses uh, by the international community. And whether it's um, uh, Cuba, whether it's Zimbabwe or Venezuela, um, you know, the impact um, uh, is affects uh, the most vulnerable uh, in the main. And so, you know, we, we, we do that. I must also just use this opportunity to express solidarity with the people and families of Palestine, uh, because we cannot sit back and the theoretically discuss families without calling out the destruction of families uh, as witness in Gaza. Uh, and I must reiterate that, um, uh, you know, uh, we have many a times um, uh, highlighted that it's not about the countries, but it's about the humanitarian emergency, uh, and um, given that the vulnerable are most affected, I think that's important. Um, just very briefly on the role of the UN, I think the UN bodies need to obviously understand uh, the unique context of families uh, within countries, as many of my colleagues have already spoken. Um, and I think, you know, support, uh, um, you know, countries uh, within a number of aspects, for example, uh, in terms of policy guidance and advocacy, in terms of data collection and monitoring, especially towards uh, the development of evidence-based policy making. Um, capacity building through technical uh, assistance and support, uh, and of course resource mobilization, as my colleague has already indicated. But perhaps also in terms of advancing uh, inclusive partnerships uh, with all sectors of society, including the private sector, civil society, um, governments, and of course um, 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 uh, think tanks and um, academia. So lastly, I think what is important, moderator, uh, is that we, we, we must um, call for a developmental and rights-based approach to family policy. That's fundamental. Uh, if we don't do that, then we, we, we lose track of what we're trying to do, um, rather than focusing on an ideological approach. And I think that through the SDGs, uh, we committed, uh, all of us, to ensure that we leave no one behind. Um, and if we become ideological about families, we run the risk of leaving many people behind. So I think that that's an important point that we really stress. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Machuno, for this important message at the end about the importance of an inclusive approach to families as we think about these issues. Um, I wish to thank all the panelists for their excellent presentations, and we hope that these will support member states and other stakeholders in their efforts to make family-oriented policies and programs an integral part of their overall socioeconomic policy making. I thank also all the participants who intervened today and who made contributions to this panel discussion. The discussions from this dialogue will be reflected, I understand, in the chair's summary and become part of the inputs to ECOSOC and its high-level segment as well as the 2024 high-level political forum. I thank you for your attention and I give the floor back to the chair. Thank you very much. Colleagues, we've reached the end of a very interesting high-level panel discussion on the 30th anniversary of the International Year of the Family and I thank the distinguished panelists once again and delegations as well for their participation and their contributions. Before adjourning this meeting, I would like to remind you that at 3 p.m. this afternoon, the Commission will resume its consideration of agenda item 3C to hold a panel discussion on emerging issues. I would also like to remind you that the deadline for the submission of draft proposals is 3 p.m. today. On that note, the meeting is adjourned.